The first question is a fill in the blank question. And it is uh, to answer the statement, every day I change the world by dot, dot, dot. And why don't we start with you, Michelle? Okay. Um, well, I'll speak just as a human in this uh, polarized world. Every day I start by being nice and being present to others. And in addition, in my personal career, it's really been driven by tackling climate change. So I worked for um, 11 years at the Nature Conservancy, which is a wonderfully impactful global environmental organization. And I had the opportunity recently to become the CEO of Evergreen, which is tackling some of the very vexing problems of the technologies we need to uh, have the solutions that will give us the breathable, livable world that we all want. That's great. Every day, start by being nice. That's it. I'm going to tell that to my two twin eight-year-old boys at home. They, they could benefit from that one. Go ahead, Trent. Yeah. Uh, so I guess change the world by growing the best watermelon in my neighborhood, I think, is probably the best, <laughs> one, so at least what, what I think. Um, no, uh, so uh, as a climate scientist and in, in my position, what drew me to kind of the public sector was really helping people. Um, I always enjoyed, I actually was, I think, the only person in the world that ever enjoyed the service industry because you could actually help people. And, uh, and so in, in my current role, being able to work with especially under-resourced communities, people who are in sectors that are really impacted by climate change but just don't know where to start in solving it, um, I work with those folks every single day, and that's, uh, that's, a, that's a real pleasure. Love it. Helping people and growing watermelons. Kit? So I'm trained as a systems and molecular biologist, and so I have a very biased perspective in saying that I love working with biology, uh, both as a manufacturing platform, but also looking to, to nature to see different ways that you know, the natural world has already figured out different ways of solving some of the world's most intractable problems. So when it comes to climate change, nature has been around for a while, and it's a very fun place to draw inspiration from and collaborate with. Excellent. And great segue to Erin, who leads the, the Nature Museum. Well, I, I love this question, and I'm a big believer that big change takes a team. So my humble hope is that what we do as a team at the Nature Museum and sort of what motivates me every morning to wake up is to create those positive connections between people and nature. So great, great segue. That's our mission. That's what we've done for um, over a century, 167 years now. And that effort to create those positive connections when we so often see what happens when there's negative connections between people and nature is what really um, motivates me and what I hope, how I hope to change the world. Yeah, terrific. And how about you, Andrea? How do you hope to change the world each day? Ah, uh, well, is this, this is on, I don't know. Okay, um, the, I've been at the Botanic Garden for a very long time and I really love our, our mission of cultivating the power of plants to sustain and enrich life. And in my work and the work of my colleagues and collaborators, we really work to help shape how people experience and how they value and then how they care for the planet. And in my role specifically, I get to work with both our, our scientific expertise as well as our natural area stewardship to understand and better, more effectively restore and sustainably use and manage the amazing native plant diversity that's present here in the Chicago region. We are so lucky to have what we do have. Um, and I'm excited about the opportunity to, to just continue to connect people and support the conservation and sustainable use of those, those resources, which we'll talk more about. Terrific, love it. Let's, uh, let's kick it over to you, Trent. So you are the state's leading authority on climate-related issues. Um, by the way, this week, uh, Trent told me before that all, uh, many of the other state uh, climatologists are all convening. So it's good to know that there's people out there that are everyday focused, right, on these topics across the whole country. So you focus on that here for Illinois. Um, so a, a question that I have is, you know, here we have a bunch of people who are passionate about this topic. What are the kinds of things that you think um, this community should be focused on right now? What, what are kind of big problems that you think we should be trying to solve? Yeah, this is a tough question, and I, uh, but it's, it's good because it kind of, I can hopefully provide a broad overview a little bit. And five, five steps here, but it'll be quick, I promise. Um, so uh, we think about this, this group is interested in innovation, right? The, by, by the name innovation and kind of the cutting edge of solving the, the most intractable problems. And 
Um, there's this really, when we think about climate change, oftentimes it really comes, it starts with mitigation, which is really a re reduction in greenhouse gas concentrations in the atmosphere, not just emissions, but, but concentrations, bringing those down. So innovation and mitigation, and, and, and for most cases, that means low or no carbon energy sources as quickly as possible, um, and innovation in, in the energy infrastructure to make sure, especially in agriculture, industry, and, and uh, manufacturing, transportation, and uh, um, power generation, that we get as quickly as possible to, um, to low or no carbon infrastructure. The other piece of that, though, is energy efficiency, which is often, kind, is often sort of uh, overlooked when it comes to innovation. Uh, I'll just give an example. Uh, if we think about the, the rapid transition to maybe not so rapid, but it, it seems rapid transition to EVs for the personal transportation industry, well, we, can, we can take every single gas or diesel powered car on the road in Chicago and convert them to an EV, and, and that does have substantial benefit, or we can improve the reliability and the accessibility of public transit, and now you're taking hundreds of cars off the road. Uh, and so that's a, a form of, of innovation and energy efficiency where we're just overall using less energy uh, as opposed to just changing the sources of energy. So that's in kind of mitigation. Also innovation and adaptation to climate change, which we know that and we've already seen impacts related to climate change. We saw the wildfire air quality issues. We had two uh, over thousand year flooding events uh, last year in Chicagoland alone. Um, and uh, so preparing and, and, and improving our resilience to to those types of extreme events is really important. So innovation in there. Um, the, the other three are equity, and I, and I, and I want to say that over all of these things, and having an umbrella of equity as far as making sure that, that um, every place, the most vulnerable uh, among us in Chicago, but across the, across the globe, are, um, are not left behind in the, in the push for, for resilience and climate change. That is not just a resource grab where we have those who are able to uh, afford resilience are able to get it. So innovation and equity. But what I meant by the first mention of equity was just the, the availability of resources. Uh, and this is something that we've seen more recently, especially with the influx of federal dollars, is that there's a lot of work to do. And a lot of times, uh, especially small municipalities that I work with outside of the Chicagoland area, they know exactly what they need to do. It's just there's no resources for them available because their sustainability manager is also the fire chief and the dog catcher and the mayor part time. So that those that's that really is a challenge. Uh, the availability of that equity is extremely important. Um, and then I knew I was going to forget my last one, but as uh, <laughs> I was a list here, um, Let's but say a four, a four steps. Then. Four steps, I think, is good. Yeah, yeah. Oh, I'm just real quick. Uh, science. Uh, this is ADD, right? Working in, in full. Um, so science. You know, as a scientist, uh, I'll just call out my 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 climate scientists here. A lot of times, we kind of are enamored with the problem. Uh, where, and and, and uh, what we've seen over the last 10 to 20 years of science, especially climate science, is a repeat of the same maps of, just say, the city of Chicago, right? Say, this is the hottest part of Chicago. This is the, the place that gets flooded the most. And every single map looks the same. And when you go to the communities that are affected by those hazards, they say, yeah, yeah, we know that we're hot here. We need to fix it, right? And so for science, it's really need to transcend being enamored with the problem and, 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 and just measuring the problem and really making that science work for the solution. Uh, so innovation in science to make sure that that science can be used. Last piece I want to I want to I want to make is just an example. Um, the uh, anybody from Chicago Region Trees Initiative in the house or Morton Arboretum? Former. Okay, yeah. Okay, good. So I can I can I can shout out here. This is a great example of of I think of exactly what I talked about from mitigation adaptation from science and from policy and equity. We've seen those, those studies that say that these are the hottest, the south side, the west side of Chicago, those are the hottest parts of the city. And yet over the last 20 years, the majority of tree planting has been outside of those areas. And we know that tree planting from science is, is one of the best ways to, to cool urban areas. And so from the influx of federal dollars from making that equity available, Chicago Region Trees Initiative is now uh, distributing significant funds to the most vulnerable communities, the hottest communities in the Chicagoland area, to improve that tree planting. So that's how we go from science to mitigation adaptation of climate change. It's a great example, and it's really the innovation community that's pushing that. So sorry for the long answer. But no, that's great. That's a good that. framework. Those, those, thank you. All right, since you mentioned planting trees, I'm going to hop over to you, Erin, and the Nature Museum. So, um, you know, in the innovation community, uh, a lot of us value technology. 
as a way to solve problems or an enabler of solving problems. Um, now sometimes though, uh, for climate related problems, nature can be a good way to solve the problem. You don't need technology per se, right? There's natural, the natural world, natural processes. So my question to you is what are some nature-based solutions that excite you when it comes to climate related issues? Great question and also great segue. I think, so first in general, the reason that people get excited about nature-based solutions is they not only provide that sort of human societal benefit, health, climate mitigation, et cetera, but also great environmental benefit. If you think about like reduction in biodiversity, et cetera. So on a day like today, when it's warm, I'm like, do I wear the jacket, do I not? Parks, you think about parks, green rooftops, go to Fulton Market, you see so many of the new buildings that are having the green rooftops. That's a great nature-based solution that I get excited about. It has their science behind kind of how there's that correlates to improved air quality, et cetera. So trees, parks, et cetera. But another one that I just have to give a shout out to that's not often talked about as much as kind of parks and trees is restoration efforts. So if you think about just like wetland restoration, forest restoration, et cetera, um, that hits close to home at the Nature Museum. So wetlands in Illinois has a lot, just have some of the greatest amount of biodiversity um, on the planet. They're just incredibly diverse ecosystems. And when it comes to species that we work a lot with at the Nature Museum, like the wood frog, which is a species in greatest conservation needs, restoring those wetlands is, is critically important. So then the other, because I, I love this question, another great example, um, I think in Illinois as well, is thinking about biodiversity friendly agriculture, where the food and ag capital of the world, there's lots of great examples on how we can not only produce the food that we need, but do so in a way that's benefiting the environment. Um, there was a case study, I think it came out of like Sato, Japan, where a rice field that was devastated during a natural disaster had to be replanted, and they did so in such a way that was essentially creating um, an ecosystem that was helping the farmers achieve their economic livelihood, but also ensuring that species thrive in that environment. So there's many nature-based solutions, and I'm excited that now there's getting we're getting more attention around it. Yeah, that's a terrific answer, and it's also a good uh, foundation for later today. We're talking about wetlands during the water panel, and we're talking about agriculture during the food panel, and we're talking about energy efficiency during the energy panel. So you can see all these topics are very interconnected. Um, since you mentioned restoration, uh, so to your left you have the Senior Director of Restoration Ecology at the Botanic Garden. So um, a question for you, Andrea. You know, When you think about Chicago, right? Chicago is tall buildings. It is sidewalks, it's streets, it's highways, it's stadiums, it's landmarks, it's a whole bunch of concrete. And so the topic of native plant diversity is not all, it's not ever present in, in front of us. Um, so my question uh, to you is, you know, how come and, and really why why is the topic of, of native plants um, you know, so important in big cities as it relates to the air we breathe? Excellent question. Um, so I guess following up on my comment that we have an amazing amount of native plant diversity here and also Aaron's excellent point that, that wetland and the native plant diversity in the wetlands is really critical to supporting some really important nature-based solutions. Um, I will say that we have, we have 1,300 native plant species just in this region. We're one of the most like native plant diverse urban areas in the country. And it's a huge resource that I think we're, we're missing, on, op, missing out on in opportunities for nature-based solutions with it. Of those species, fewer than 200 are trees. Trees are super important, but there are so many other species that do really, really important things for our, our ecosystems, but also for us. And we know very little about them, and we know very little about how to effectively manage and restore them. So why that's important for the air that we breathe is because trees do provide a huge, hugely important component of mitigating some of, the, some of the aspects of being in a very urban setting with a lot of concrete. They provide shade and they help cool spaces. Um, but the more diverse a uh, planting is, the more diverse a natural area is, the greater the, the benefits that come from that, the more carbon sequestration, the greater accumulation of pollutants, and just the, the better regulation over time, including through, through droughts and heat and freezing spells, they're much more resilient the more diverse that they are. Um, so we're working really actively to understand how to support and restore diverse native plant communities, 
both in natural areas as well as in very urban settings. So like on green roofs, we've, exper we've examined how the native plant species from, from this region can perform on green roofs and made recommendations about what species may be best able to survive up there and also provide great resources for pollinators and other wildlife that aren't expecting to see this really amazing uh, wildflower that it needs to survive um, in an urban setting. Um, so we've done research like that and I thought maybe a good example would be, <clears throat> sorry, from one of, the, one of the natural areas at the Botanic Garden in, at our main campus in Glencoe. Um, it's called McDonald Woods. It's 100 acres of a remnant woodland that 30 years ago was mostly buckthorn and some very tall old oak trees. Um, and 30 years ago, we started actively restoring this space. So we, were, we, we removed the invasive species slowly and over time. We reintroduced prescribed fire, which the Native American tribes in this region for centuries before European colonization were, were using to manage and support native plant diversity. We've reintroduced fire to that space. And then we've actively seeded millions of seeds of hundreds of native species that, that are most likely to thrive in that space. And, after the la in this, and now we have more than 500 native plant species that are thriving in this area. We know how to, how to grow them, how to support their, their ability to thrive in this space. And they themselves are supporting thousands of wildlife species as well as helping to, helping to support the air that we breathe in, in many ways in sequestering carbon. We've actually done research to show that the woods that are restored with more diverse species are actively sequestering more carbon than those that are just oaks and buckthorn, which as you drive home, you might notice that there we have a lot of a lot of unrestored spaces with a lot of potential for much more effective nature-based solutions with more active stewardship um, and the incorporation of more native plant diversity into those spaces. Um, the last thing I'll mention is that it's great to know about the native plants and how to grow them and where they can be grown, but one of the biggest limitations to to being able to do this and employ this for nature-based solutions is that they're not available to homeowners, to practitioners. Finding the, the appropriate native plant species for the work that you're doing can be incredibly challenging, and many of them are just not available in a marketplace at all. Some of them are very, very available, like some of the most common prairie species you can grow in your, you can purchase in some cases even at Home Depot now. Um, but for the most part, it's very challenging to find them. And so we're actively working with collaborators locally, regionally, and nationally to change this. This is not unique to the Chicago region. It's, it's, it's really, it's a global problem. There was a, we were actively a part of a, a National Academy of Sciences report on the native seed supply in the US that found that with, even with unlimited money to purchase seeds, there just aren't enough native seeds of, a, of the right native species available in the marketplace. And so there are huge supply and demand challenges there, um, as well as just the science to understand how to grow some of these very challenging species, because they're all unique and they all have their own story to tell and they all can make it really hard to actually get them to grow. So we're actively working to help develop collaborations across the, the region and, and across the nation, including the development of a national interagency seed and restoration center um, that was just announced this year, and a bill was introduced in the House and the Senate last week to help support it, like to help codify it and then provide funding for it that would really help bring everybody together to, to, to meet this demand for native seeds. Terrific. Well, fascinating how, how nature can be a, a instigator of all these uh, solutions to challenges that we face. I want to swing the pendulum back to technology, and we'll start with you, Kit, and then we'll go to you, Michelle. So. Uh, Lanza Tech is a great example of a very innovative company that has really leaned, in, leaned into technology being a tool uh, to combat climate change. I mean, so much so there's a, a thousand patents to support your technology. And, and, and counting. And counting. And counting. And so my question to you is, um, you know, we've, I've heard the word carbon come out, I think, of, of everyone's mouth so far today. You know, carbon footprint is a term that we all are well aware of now. Uh, you are a carbon recycling technology company. And most people might think, like, well, what, what is that exactly? So maybe you can say a bit more about you know, what, what that is, um, differences between good and bad carbon, which people here might not know that that's, that's a thing, and really how can we you know, think about what you do as a way to also be combating climate change? Excellent question. So I, I think to start by answering it, I, I want to turn to everyone in the audience and take a look around you. The clothes that you're wearing, 
the, the chairs that you're sitting on, the materials that are surrounding us, even you know, the invisible atmosphere that we are breathing. It all contains carbon. You know, if you feel your, your clothing, whether it's cotton, that's co carbon too, but it could be synthetics. Um, and the majority of these materials come from virgin fossil fuels. So they're extracted from the ground and turned into all sorts of different things. But what most people don't realize is that that isn't the only way to make a lot of the things that we need and depend on every day. So for example, the shoes that I'm wearing, which are not very business casual, <laughs> um, the, the polyester on the tops of these are actually made from steel mill emissions that were turned into a material that we know and use every day. And so at Lanza Tech, we believe that there's enough carbon above ground to make everything that we need. Um, and we've developed a commercial technology that is doing just that. So we work with all different forms of waste carbon. At commercial scale, we're working with industrial emissions and we capture them and convert them into new sustainable raw materials to make everything from sustainable aviation fuel to yoga pants with Lululemon, or actually shorts with Lululemon, um, running shoes, we can make food grade and pharmaceutical grade packaging, at, as well as things like personal care ingredients. And so you can really see that carbon is in everything. And we don't want to disparage you know, good carbon versus bad carbon per se, but the carbon that's above ground is good usable carbon that we should be keeping in circulation. And so the way that we do that is you can think about it kind of like the way that you make beer. Um, we work with a very cool type of bacteria that loves to eat carbon emissions. And so we've got these very cool bioreactors that we plug onto the emissions um, in flu stacks of different industrial facilities. And instead of those emissions being emitted into the atmosphere, we feed them to our bacteria. And they love them. They're toxic for us, but not for our bacteria. And they convert them into ethanol and other commodity chemicals that usually are made from petroleum. And those get turned in all sorts of things. And to the last point, and I know we're talking about the air that we breathe, but what happens to all the different materials around us that we're wearing, that we use every day, single-use plastics, they probably get put into landfill, incinerated, or when it comes to emissions, put into that, back into the atmosphere. Um, and so what we're developing is a way also, in addition to just an emission stream, being able to capture all these different materials and put them into the same process. And so we're at pre-commercial scale for that, stay tuned, but we love carbon and we want everyone to take a look around and, and see things as, um, as the, the starting point for making new things rather than something that becomes a liability. Incredible. What a fascinating company that's here in Skokie, right? That's where you're based. Now, something I also want to share, if I'm not mistaken, the company was founded in New Zealand. Is that correct? So they could have stayed in New Zealand. They could have moved anywhere in the world, and you chose Skokie, Illinois. And, and I think it's partially because there's uh, an amazing community here that supports climate innovators and I'm looking at you, Michelle, because you run an organization that's at the center of this. So uh, continuing down this path, um, you know, so Evergreen Climate Innovations uh, supports, invests in, incubates amazing startups that are focused on all these climate-related problems. Um, what are some examples that you're excited about? And also, you know, what is it that the whole Chicago um, ecosystem can continue to do to nurture companies that are uh, making the air we breathe better. Okay, so um, thank you. And yes, at Evergreen, we find, fund, and we help grow very early stage climate technologies in the greater Midwest and certainly in the Chicagoland area. Um, I'll give a couple of examples. Uh, one uh, you may have seen in the news because it's had some great successes, and that's Nanograph. So this is one of our first portfolio investments Nanograph has created a super energy dense battery. And this is very important because the smaller batteries are, the more lightweight, the more reliable, um, the more uses they can have. So think making our electric cars run further and so on. 
So Nanograph sprouted from Northwestern University from a lab and uh, went to prototype and now are building a 60,000 square foot of production facility in the West Loop and, and they're getting a lot of attention for that. They have a huge contract with the Department of Defense. Um, it turns out that when soldiers go into um, deployment, they carry a tremendous number of batteries. They need to have electricity with them. It usually is 20 pounds or more. Are you hearing a? A little bit. Yeah, okay. Okay. Um, so, and um, Nanograph has been able to reduce the weight by, by 30%. So Nanograph is a, a smashing success in a way we're going to reach our, our clean energy future. Another investment we've made is IntelliHot. Uh, think about tankless water heaters. I hope many of you have invested in them for your home. It gives you on-demand hot water so you don't have to have a tank heating the water at all times, and it saves a lot of carbon. And, um, or CO2 emissions. Um, so IntelliHot makes these same boilers on demand, but they are modular and they go into uh, industrial settings. And so they can save up to 40% of the energy that would have been used otherwise. And so as I think about, so what does the ecosystem mean? I, I, I love it you mentioned Chicago Regional Trees Initiative and you know that was part of the ecosystem with Aaron that I worked in in the Nature Conservancy. In the, in the climate tech space, there is a vibrant ecosystem here in Chicagoland. And Evergreen is part of it, but we also have M-Hub on the western edge of Fulton Market, giving inventors and entrepreneurs the space to make their products. You have P33, which is working uh, with Governor Pritzker and many others thinking about getting big industry here that will electrify our cars and give us um, battery production. We have Current, which is working on water quality and early uh, technologies by water that are both keeping us more water resilient and also removing pollutants. I won't go into the projects that we have with each of them, but we have them. And it's because that's how an ecosystem works. We know what each of the, the component parts does, we do different things and we complement one another. And so one of the things that I'm super excited about is an initiative called the Chicagoland Climate Investment Alliance. And this was started by World Business Chicago as well as Governor Pritzker, also in, in um, conjunction with several large corporate partners. And what they saw, like we do in the ecosystem, that the more we can work together and bring up the scope for bigger vision and to have arms together in order to bring federal dollars and, and more connectivity, the more we'll get done. And so that's something that an ecosystem does and it's happening here, but we could do more. Great. Oh, can I give one example? Of course, okay. go right ahead. So let, let me get, so what I meant to say, so bedrock materials is a really good example of this. This is the very latest investment uh, that we've done at Evergreen in our portfolio. So bedrock is founded by a CEO named Spencer Gore. Spencer Gore went to University of Illinois Champaign-Urbana, and then he went off to Stanford and worked on a battery technology that uses saline um, ion technology in order to make um, a different kind of battery than the lithium ion batteries that are the more traditional source. And as he came to his prototype one year ago today, he began to think about what, where should I build this promising business? And he came to Chicago, not just to come home, but because of our vibrant um, workforce, because of our vibrant university system, but also because Argonne National Labs pioneered the sodium ion technology. And um, I'll slightly misquote him, but he, he said something like this in Cranes that they're just spitting out the, the, the postdocs that know what need to be done in my factory. And so you think about that's an ecosystem. And oh, by the way, where is he starting his 
his you know, first facility at our very own M Hub. And so um, it really does take a village, and it takes government, it takes the ecosystem partners, and it takes the entrepreneurs themselves in order to make it happen. Excellent, excellent summary. And you know, some of those organizations that you mentioned, Michelle, during the um, networking cocktail reception at the end of this event, we've got M Hub up there, we've got Evergreen up there, we have Argon up there, we have Current up there, so you can actually physically meet the leaders of these different ecosystem organizations. There's Generator, there's a handful of others that are up there. Um, and also the first two startups you mentioned, Intellihot and Nanograph, the CEOs of both companies are speaking at the energy panel in a, in a couple hours from now. So uh, did, is that why you picked them or just coincidence? I think I might have saw it at one time. Okay. But now, well, the invitation think, was working then, that's good. Excellent. So, um, well, I've asked some questions of the panelists, but I bet some of you have some questions that, that you'd like to ask too. So let's um, turn over to the audience for a couple questions. What, what questions do you have for this group? I have a couple more myself, but I want to give the audience a chance. I, okay, let's go here, Robert. If you could, uh, actually, you know what, here, let me come down to, I'll, here, thanks, Paul. What requests do you have of this audience? For example, you'd like us to do more blank, you'd like us to do less blank. More blank and less blank, fill in the blank. Have you been listening to the FT Weekend uh, Arts and Culture podcast? That's always their question at the end, <laughs> more or less. Um, I would say, as from Lanza Tech's perspective, um, I'd say more encouragement and less criticism when it comes to companies that are trying new things in sustainability. I think it's really tempting to um, to point out what's not working or, you know, an imperfect solution rather than necessarily pointing out this is progress, this is beneficial. You know, we work with different brands that don't necessarily want to talk about the fact that they're using recycled carbon emissions in their products because they're afraid that they're going to get accused of greenwashing. When instead, this is something that's incredible and is such a compelling material to be working with that we can drop right into the way that we make other things. Um, so that would be my, my request to the audience. <laughs> Just building off that and also the great point that Michelle made is, especially for the companies out there, looking at points of synergy because we can go further faster. So if you have an objective, who else in the ecosystem is working on that where we can collaborate, get additional funding, prioritize, find those points in the funnel where we can focus on this and you know another organization can do that. On the um, museum and cultural institution side, it's something that we do you know, very well. If we have a Mortem Arboretum or an Open Lands, et cetera, that are doing one piece, then we're very intentional about focusing on another need. But I think that collaboration is, is critical as well. Anyone else? Real quick, just a shout out to the university system here. Michelle mentioned it here, the great university system we have in Illinois. Uh, in collaboration with our great universities all across Illinois, uh, setting up pipelines. We have great students at the University of Illinois in Champaign, but of course here in Chicago and all across the state. Um, and, and in many ways, thinking about how we can scope the training that these students are getting to fit into the rapidly changing landscape of, of jobs and needs that are out there in, in the climate, environment, and technology sphere. And, and I know that students are really keen on looking at that. And so collaboration between the business environment and the universities is, is critical. That's great. And here we are at a university, School of the Art Institute. There's also many IIT students in the crowd I saw on the guest list. So yes, that's a great, great point. Any other perspectives? Andrea? I'll just bring, it, bring the plants back into the conversation. I think I'll just say more thinking about plants, more, more seeing the plants in the landscape. And as when, when you're working with plants, not just taking the, the easy way out with, with what's available and what others have used and thinking more about talking with folks that know more about the amazing diversity of species that are out there that could be useful for the nature-based solutions that you're working on. Um, and less of assuming that all of our, our green infrastructure 
will be able to just sustain and support itself. It really does require active engagement and stewardship by the communities where it is. And the more that we are all getting, the more that we all know and understand it and get involved in supporting it, the, the better off it and we will be. All right, I mentioned to add one more. Um, a big one is to eat more vegetables. It really does make a difference and you'll be healthier. But the other example I wanted to give is um, just support sustainability and circularity. There are so many, just in, in my seat at Evergreen, I get to see a lot of cool new stuff. And I, I mean, case in point, there are two women that founded a company in St. Louis where they figured out how to make um, these beautiful braids that black women wear out of banana fiber. And they're saving millions upon millions of tons from landfills and they are healthier and they have less emissions and they're beautiful. So there's just a lot of ingenuity and it, it's, for me, in a complex word, world, it's a source of hope to just lean into that sort of circularity and look for the ingenuity. I love that. And uh, in addition to eating more vegetables, growing more of your own vegetables, I'll add that too. But that's for the food we eat panel, so. Um, let's do another question. I saw some other hands. Uh, yes, you, and if you can speak loudly. We work with a lot of batteries, but I kind of want to ask my colleague Paul to answer. There's a battery cycling expert in the audience, Rob, who deals with another one of our batteries. Thank you. <laughs> Yeah, thank you. You know, we always know uh, we're doing an event for innovators when the audience sometimes has the best answer to the question. All right, I think we have time for probably maybe one last audience question. Is there any? Uh, yes, you gentlemen over there. That's you. What, what are the best trees for those of us interested in planting trees? I can, I can answer that, but if anyone else can, please, as well. Um, each species is different in its ability to, to store carbon and to survive drought and withstand flooding and, and also um, sequester particulate matter and other pollutants. Each one is completely different, and so really the solution is to make sure that you have diverse, diverse tree, tree plantings and where possible that it's not just the trees that you're looking at. The trees don't, the trees do a lot, but it's not just the trees. The shrubs, the wildflowers, and the grasses all provide really important aspects of sequestering carbon, filtering pollutants, and, and really just being able to survive and, and support all of those resources at the same time. Any other? The only thing I would briefly add, and I think Trent, you touched on in the beginning, is there's also a lot of data that exists out there about the areas in the Chicago that are in greatest need especially if you think about like environmental injustice. So there's indices that sort of say where in Chicago we need to focus. So concentrating and focusing those sustainability efforts in those areas of greatest need first is also hugely important. 
At the Nature Museum, we have a program called the Chicago Conservation Corps. It essentially trains Chicagoans on sustainability and conservation efforts. And one of the things that we're doing is making sure that we're very concentrated first in those areas of greatest need. Excellent. Well, we are at time. So round of applause for our fantastic <laughs> Air We Breathe panelists. Thank you. What is your biggest concern? when it comes to water as a resource today. And just make sure uh, everyone's microphones are turned on. Uh, well, I guess I would answer that question saying too much or too little. Um, I feel like with the impacts of the climate crisis, we are getting inundated. It was mentioned earlier in the panel before about 100 year plus floods. We know that we're getting more rain in the Chicago area, but other places are getting less. And in particular, where we live, we designed our sewer system to throw our water away. We reversed the Chicago River system in 1900, and all of our sewers, everything is directed to get water as fast as we possibly can to the river system and out of our watershed, which is not the natural way watersheds function. So I would say that's one of my biggest concerns is how we manage water. And we talked a lot about nature-based solutions, which I think will continue through this panel. Yep. Excellent. Kareen, what's your biggest concern today in water? Uh, but, but first, I will, I will echo what just, you know, Margaret just said, clearly too much or too little, but I will add something around public health. Uh, and as much like, you know, people are concerned, but the level of understanding of what's in the water and what to do in order to get rid of it, um, I think it's not as widespread as I would like it to be. Okay. And Howard, I know I've, I've read your columns. I know you have a number of concerns, but what's your biggest concern as it relates to water today? It's not business as usual. Oh, I think it makes sure your yeah. mic is. Yeah. Thank you, Margaret. It's not business as usual. Climate change is real. Game on, okay? We need to rethink the shoreline's built environment based on climate change realities. More intense storms, high winds, heavy waves battering the shoreline. We all love the lake, we love the lakefront, but it's not business as usual. Example one, Army Corps of Engineers putting a toxic waste dump on the southeast side in an environmental justice community on the shores of Lake Michigan where it will be battered by heavy winds and waves. That doesn't make sense. The lakefront's for people and parks, not for toxic waste. We need to do things differently. We need to rethink the shoreline's built environment. Well said, Howard. Yes, Mike. I was gonna offer a perspective. I think all of the work that all of these people are doing is, is wonderful, but I'm kind of an optimist. When you think about the problems of water, you know, they really come down in two categories, scarcity and quality. But after doing some research, I realized that there's plenty of water in the world. I mean, 97% of the water on the planet is in the oceans. 3% is fresh. And of that 3%, less than one third of 1% is what's in the rivers, the Great Lakes, you know, the, the snow, everywhere. So when you really step back and think about it, there's plenty of water on the planet to service everyone's needs. There's just two problems we have to solve. It's getting water from where it is to where it's needed, or getting water from the quality it is to the quality that's needed. Now those are big problems, but with innovation, which is what Luke does, uh, and all of these people are working on, uh, responsible capital allocation, and some creative business models, we can solve these problems. And I've been seeing this over 30 years, so it's really exciting that I think all of the problems that we talk about can be solved. You know, innovation at its root starts with problems to be solved, and I think Mike just perfectly articulated two paths that any water innovator may choose to pursue to really help us uh, in the whole water space. That's great. I always love a good optimist to my left, so thanks, Mike. All right, uh, Melissa. What's your big concern in water today? Thanks, and I'll bring us back to some of the problems that we need innovation to solve. And for me, those are the unpredictability and changing patterns of precipitation and where water is on the landscape, when it's coming, and how much. And that influences the animals that need water, as well as people. Think about our crops that we grow, right? Our plants rely on these predictable cycles of when it's wet, 
and when it will be dry for us to plan for our food security, um, our water needs, and sort of our overall welfare um, for plants, animals, and humans. So I think this is where we need an innovation is to figure out how do we get water where it is and where it will be. I love it. Well, let's keep, let's keep staying on this positive train with innovation and optimism and, 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 and all the good stuff. So, Mike, I've got another question for you. So some people, you may not know this, but Chicago has a, has a nickname sometimes. It's called the Silicon Valley of Water. And when you hear that, that phrase, you think, well, that's a good phrase. You know, but what, is, what exactly does that mean? You know, what are the assets that are here? And, and you know, what advantages do you see of being able to do business in Chicago in the water industry? Well, I, I've used that phrase a number of times. You know, when you stop and think about it, we've got 6% of the world's fresh water, or 20% uh, of the world's fresh water, excuse me, sitting in the Great Lakes, and about 6% of the population of the world sitting in the United States. So we've got plenty of water, but concentration right here in this Great Lakes area, this Chicagoland area, is, is very strong. But over the time of U.S. Filter, we bought like 300 companies. In, er in the early days, I started noticing that there was a significant number of companies that we were acquiring right around Chicago, 15 or 20 in our first couple of years. And that's the reason I moved from California to Chicago. So what I've seen over the years is there's a wonderful heritage here. You have Nalco Chemical, now owned by Ecolab. You have Culligan. You have Sloan, you have other companies, and then hundreds of smaller companies related to treating water, boilers, chemicals, doing things that are around this area. So what we found is there is a, um, a, a plethora of engineering talent in this community and within a couple of hundred miles from here through the universities, the labs, and other things. So to me, this is the area that companies ought to locate when they're in the water business and they want talent, they want ideas, they want experience. So I think that's why I think of it as the Silicon Valley of water. Yeah, well that's great. I mean, it sounds like we just need to do more storytelling around that to keep attracting smart people to Chicago to, um, you know, to, do, to do business here in, in the water space. Um, so Corrine, over at Veolia, so you do a whole lot with, with wastewater. And uh, wastewater production, for those of you who don't know, um, it's expected to increase by over 50% by the year 2050. So that's a pretty alarming stat. Um, what do we do about this? Uh, y yes, indeed. Uh, and if I c can pose a second on, on that uh, number, because maybe you're wondering, I mean, you know, we don't create new water, right? So how come there's so much more wastewater expected? Uh, well, first, you know, population is growing, there's more industries. I mean, the newer industries are extremely water, I mean, high in water consumption, data centers, microelectronics. But there's also a big impact of climate change because climate change uh, impacts, you know, of course, you know, linked to carbon, but it's also linked to a big disruption of the water cycle. Uh, the too much or too little, uh, if I just pose on the too much, much more floods, what that means is that there's tons of storm water that gets somewhere at some point in the sewage system. And so which is why the volumes of wastewater are increasing so much. Uh, but now uh, I'll start my, my positive hat uh, is I think wastewater does need a rebrand. For years treating wastewater, it's been about taking out the waste portion of it, sludge, biosolids, and just discharging the clean water in some type of environmental you know, body of water, groundwater, river, a lake, etc. And we've been doing that for years, not so long, by the way. I mean, at the first wastewater plants in the US, they are barely 100 years old, so it's really not that old. Uh, but what's happening now at scale is that first, the waste portion is not waste anymore. With sludge and biosolids, you can do two things. Uh, you can produce biogas. You can do fertilizers, which is then used to raise cattle, produce crops. Uh, and that's not a innovation. It's been going on for years. Here in Chicago, uh, the wastewater, whole wastewater system, 25% of its energy used is actually coming from the biogas produced by its own waste. Uh, not far from here in Milwaukee, 
uh, we announced, I mean, at Veolia we call that concept of you know, producing like things out of wastewater an eco-factory. And we formally launched that in Milwaukee with the mayor, I would say two or three months ago. Uh, in Milwaukee, we are going to bring the whole wastewater treatment to a net zero, uh, zero waste, zero energy, uh, like whole concept in the next few years. Second, the water portion of, you know, that you take out once you take the waste out of it doesn't have to be discharged in a river or a lake. You can reuse it on site, which saves tons of, you know, economy, like economy of scale, like, you know, and, and that's happening as well at scale across the US. So just to say that we can do a lot of things which don't make such a big numbers of increase by 50% such a bad news. I would close though at the fact that there's only 20% of the volumes of wastewater in the world which are treated. What that means is there's literally 80% that get discharged without any treatment. And that's where I think innovation is going to be a big differentiator because being able to bring the thinking I was describing around making wastewater a circular thing, producing energy, resources, bringing revenue, that will help bring sanitation at scale in the areas and places which need it the most. And I would add wastewater is a great source of drinking water once you remove all the nutrients for direct or indirect potable reuse. I know people don't like to hear that, but it, you know, it's interesting to me that to take wastewater and make it potable is less than the cost of desalinating seawater. Like, like one-tenth of it, yes, and much less energy consumption, absolutely. It's a fascinating point, actually, Mike, that you raised, and thank you, Corrine, for, for all, all the data and all the, the, the thinking that you bring to that topic. Uh, so I saw you nodding your head a whole bunch, Margaret, as Corrine was speaking. So I'm going to ask you the next question, uh, and it's about the Chicago River. So the Chicago River, we all know about the Chicago River. Some of us, uh, our relationship with it is a place we go on St. Paddy's Day when it turns green. For others, it's a, a place to dump a lot of rubber duckies in sometimes, which I think just happened recently. Um, but the river actually has a lot of unique functions. What are some unique functions that you know about that you think would surprise our audience here? Well, I think, first of all, with the Chicago Calumet River system um, is the fact is where it flows. It's 156 miles. It's the brook in, the nor in Northbrook. It's part of the Skokie Lagoons. The northernmost parts are seven miles from Wisconsin. I mean, it's really a very, very different river system than the main stem, which is where it gets dyed green, unfortunately, and gets the rubber duckies, which is fun. Um, and so I think the big surprise is where it is. And then the other thing I think is that it actually plays this really important role as a blue-green corridor. This is a connector. It brings communities together. It brings people together. But it also brings wildlife together. And so the river system is alive. And not that many people understand that. There's more. There's 80 species of fish up from 10 in the 1970s. There are turtles, muskrats, beavers, otters, there's herons, there's, you know, just nesting bald eagles, nesting osprey. It is alive with wildlife. And the other thing is that it serves as a really important recreational function. I mean, there's a whole, you could go on all day about the unique aspects and the value and the ecosystem services, but you cannot possibly undervalue what recreation and natural open space can do for humankind and our health and our well-being. And so the river, as it becomes more alive, is more useful to our, the people who live here. And so that's one of the things that's been growing steadily. When I started at Friends of the Chicago River more than 20 years ago, people thought it was really strange to be on the water at all. And if you're downtown, it is one big traffic jam of canoes and kayaks and tour boats and restaurants and people, and that's happening up and down. And so that, that piece about it being wild and really belonging to people, as opposed to its history as a sanitary and ship canal, is a really important thing that people need to understand. I love that. I mean, it really is one of the most coolest assets that the city has, which, uh, raise your hand if you've not gone on the Chicago architecture boat tour. Oh, only, only like a couple people haven't, good, good, because I, anytime someone new visits me in town, I always take them on that tour. It's a whole new way to see the city and learn about the city. Excellent. Okay, well, we all know about it. All right, um, let's jump from the river to the lake, because that's another very unique thing that we have, and I've often thought that, you know, once the zombie apocalypse happens, 
everyone's flocking to Chicago because we got Lake Michigan. So we got, we got all this fresh water. We're safe. We're good. Um, so Howard, this question is for you. Um, the lake is great. It's great we have it. However, climate change is real, as you said. And what's the impact of climate change on Lake Michigan? And how should we think differently about the shoreline's built environment? You gave an example of something, uh, obviously, that has some negative impacts. Um, and, you know, and, and how do you think about the lake's ecological health in light of climate change? Wow, that's an easy question. I can probably do that in a paragraph. <laughs> Look, the Great Lakes is where we live, work, and play. Lake Michigan makes Chicago a great place to live. Great Lakes, 21% of the world's freshwater supply. 41 million people in the US and Canada get safe, clean drinking water. $7 billion annual fishing industry. And it's, if you want to talk about the economic value, how much is a condo that's a block from the lake versus a condo that's a mile from the lake? Okay, we love the lake. We're also stewards of Lake Michigan. I mean, we have this largesse, this wonderful fresh water supply. And I'll mix it up a little bit here, Mike. I disagree with you. We don't have more supply than demand. What we have is a precious resource that we need to use technology to use wisely efficiently and not waste. And that's where markets and policy come in, and that's how do we protect the shoreline. We need to think differently about land use. We need to think differently about zoning. Uh, at the Environmental Law and Policy Center, we retained 19 of the leading Midwest University and Canadian University scientists, and they put together a comprehensive report on the impact of climate change on the Great Lakes. And it's scary. So talk about markets then and policy. You know, market is lots of people want the fresh water. And as Luke, you and Mike both said, tremendous economic advantage for Chicago. Uh, you said the same thing, Karen. It brings jobs, people, and business here. So we want to use that to our advantage. From a policy, that means using it well, using technology, being more efficient, not wasting it finding ways to take wastewater and, for example, use that at Ford Motor Company's plant to blow off dust from cars that are being produced in the production line. You don't need drinking water to do that. You can use once-treated wastewater. But the policy is there is no governor, no legislator, state or federal, uh, in the Midwest, Mike, that supports putting in a pipeline and sh you know, shipping Great Lakes water to Kansas or Texas or California. Indeed, there's a federal law that prohibits that. You can't do it. Nobody supports it. So what we need to do is you just can't take water and move it all over the place. Desalinization, as you both said, is incredibly expensive. So use our technology to be really smart about how do we use water, not waste it, be efficient, take wastewater and use it for purposes where you don't use, need drinking water, be smart about the shoreline, and for that drinking water, not waste it. Price it right, use it well. Excellent. Um, what you're talking about is the innovation of getting creative with the business models and doing all that. That's what's exciting. It's, it's a little bit about business models. It's also about look at where the technology leads are. Um, Milwaukee, a lot of innovative technology on how to use water more efficiently. A lot coming from the Mideast, where they have to do that. Uh, a lot coming from Chicago, the universities you're talking about. I mean, let's, the technology piece is being really smart about how do we use water wisely, use it well, not over-irrigate, all the good ways we can use water, uh, not about how do we build tunnels to pipelines and shift it all the way around. That technology is incredibly important, and it's important because water is not overly abundant. It's a scarce resource that lots of people want to use. And if you care about the ecology of the Chicago River, you care about the ecology of Lake Michigan, you care about the ability of us to have safe, clean drinking water. You care about the fisheries industry, $7 billion a year. You care about having the lake be a wonderful place to just get out and play and enjoy. Then let's use it wisely. 
if I may chime in a little bit, because I think you said something very important. It's not, when you, you guys are saying innovation, I, I just want to say in my words, it's not about new technologies. It's about a big innovation in the way of thinking what you actually want to preserve. And when you start shifting and saying the lake as a resource, you know, we can say that about biodiversity, et cetera, then you create business models around that. Policy is a huge factor. And I think that's the innovation. It's changing what we really spend our attention and focus and resources for. And I'd just like to jump in, if I may, which is a conversation that's happening across the world, which is really this concept of one water solutions. There's just one water, which is water. So there's not wastewater and drinking water and swimming, swimming pool water or river water. It's all one water, and it's how we choose to treat it and how to take care of it and cherish it and share it. Hey, Luke, give me 30 seconds. Okay, here's where policy matters. You're on the clock. Margaret Frisbee. Friends of the Chicago River Environmental Law and Policy Center. Okay, everything Margaret just described of everybody out on kayaks on the river, there's gonna be the big swim in September. That didn't just happen, okay? Nobody waved a wand and said, Shazam, Chicago River, clean up. What happened was 15 years ago, Friends of the Chicago River, the Environmental Law and Policy Center, NRDC, the Sierra Club, filed a lawsuit before the Pollution Control Board that said to the Metropolitan Water Reclamation District, you're the only one of 30 such districts in the country that doesn't disinfect the wastewater that goes out into the river. And after leadership by the Pollution Control Board, the US EPA Regional Administrator, Senator Dick Durbin, and others, the board flipped its position put in modern pollution control technology, and we have a river now that's everything that Margaret's describing. That's what happens from policy, that's what happens from advocacy, that's what happens when you take modern pollution control technology and you actually have to put it into play. And we're gonna be swimming in the river and kayaking in the river and enjoying the river, and it takes time. But that's how change happens. I think that deserves a round of applause. So going from the river to the lake, <laughs> yeah, bring your bathing suits, we'll see you there. Um, I wanna talk about the wetlands. So, um, you know, we all know that the Amazon rainforest is like the most biodiverse place on the planet. Well, wetlands also are right up there as some of the most biodiverse places on the planet. And, and we talked about preserving the river, preserving the lake, let's talk about preserving the wetlands because there's a lot of benefits and reasons to do that. And so, Melissa, can you tell us a bit more about how the wetlands are a critical tool for water management and, and why we should be preserving them too? Yes, thank you. So I'm a wetlands biologist and I'm here to speak for the wetlands because I think a lot of us forget that they exist, especially ephemeral wetlands that dry every year. They're really easy to walk past. And when we're talking about innovation, I would agree that we want to talk about innovating our ideas and the way we think about the resources we have and the resources we are, um, how we have these nature-based solutions, right? How do we use the things that nature already has solved, right? I think it mentioned earlier that some of the concerns is that we have too much water or too little water are our biggest concerns for the future with climate change. And wetlands can help us solve both those problems, right? So we talk about water management. How do wetlands solve too much water? Well, they're basins in our landscape. They're collecting that water and they're slowing it down, right? When water hits cement or a road, it runs off. You have your river turns, in, or sorry, your road turns into a river right into the Chicago River. Right? We have these sewage overflows. If you have wetlands and the water hits that, the soils there are a sponge to soak up that water. The incredible plant diversity and abundance of plants that grow in wetlands are straws sucking that water up. And so wetlands can contain a dramatically huge, unimaginable amount of water in them to take up our flood events. I remember last summer, we got like six to nine inches of rain, depending on where you were in Chicago. We had lots of sewage overflows, flooded basements, flooded backyards. Wetlands can help mitigate flooding. They can help prevent erosion control. When you don't have enough water, again, wetlands have these soils that are absorbing that water and keeping it on the landscape. And we've seen, especially in the arid west, when you have beavers that create giant wetlands, those are mitigating wildfires. And so you have less severe, less um, impactful wildfires that are able to recover faster on the landscape 
when you have wetlands. And so wetlands really are one of these innovative solutions that already exist um, for managing water. Our friends in Milwaukee have been expressed a lot today. They have a program where they are incentivizing private and public landowners to restore and revitalize wetlands as part of their climate solution um, to sort of create a resilient um, sewage plan um, and water plan up in Milwaukee. Um, so yeah, I would just say go support your wetlands because they're already doing it. All right, say thank you to the wetlands next time you see them. Uh, let's go to the audience. Any questions from the crowd? Yes, here, and Paul, I'll hand you the microphone if you don't mind passing it. You assume I'm incapable of being loud. <laughs> <laughs> On the wetlands topic, um, I recently watched um, a film that the Chicago Parks Foundation showed, and it was talking about um, wetlands in the agricultural landscape in southern Illinois where they're trying to restore some of the wetlands where farmers have been growing because honestly they can't stop those corners from flooding anyway they're putting too much inputs what are we doing about wetland restoration issues in places that have become more urban or maybe are just slightly suburban are there any plans in place now or are there things we could be doing even in our own backyards what should we be looking at Thank you, yeah. Um, so there is a lot of restoration right here in the Chicagoland area. Chicago Park District has a huge restoration program going on, especially in the Calumet area. The Forest Reserve of the Cook County, I mean, we just passed, like everybody here, I hope you voted to increase taxes for our forest preserves, and a lot of that funding is going towards wetland restoration. And so Chicago, I think, in Cook County, the whole area has been sort of a leader in the country in sort of saving green spaces and now we are restoring those green spaces. Um, and so I think that the biggest thing we can all do is support legislation, support our organizations that are doing the on the ground work um, and doing the restoration for, this, for the resources that we already have. And um, one of my sites actually in Southern Cook County was agricultural field, is now also being restored and returned to wetland habitat. And so all these things are happening in Southern Illinois, they're all happening right here in our urban and ex-urban environment as well. Excellent. Okay, let's do one more audience question. I'm going to pick on Mike because you're representing corporate America right now. What do you think large companies can do to give back and help with the wastewater, river, lakes, and wetlands situation being representative of, a, of that population? I think uh, <clears throat> every company has got to look at water as a resource, just as everyone's been talking about and be aware of that. You know, we have one of the greatest water delivery systems of any country in the world, yet there's a lot of leakage. Our pipes are all leaking. We lose 20 or 30 percent of our water. A lot of the wastewater is being discharged to, you know, rivers and streams, and companies just need to be responsible, and you can treat that wastewater to the point where it's just as good. You know, I love the old story about Chicago was reversing the flow of the river, and they were sending the waste down to St. Louis, and St. Louis was going to sue Chicago. And then the city attorney came in and said, no, we, we can't do that because we're doing the same thing to Memphis. You know, so, uh, you, you know, if companies are responsible and they uh, comply with the law and maybe even go beyond, uh, and there's a lot of great technologies that are out there that allow that to happen even more cost effectively. I'm working with a little company that can actually take biochar and do the same things that activated carbon can do cheaper and have uh, ionic, uh, ion exchange products or capabilities in addition to um, being carbon filtration. So there's an example of an innovation that will save money for those companies and improve the water. And I think as companies continue to look, companies like Veolia continue to develop these technologies, there's a lot of great opportunity. If I can uh, ch chime in a little bit, because I think it's a very important question. You know, we talked policy, we talked activism, but of course, organizations like ours do matter. Uh, I would say two things. Uh, the way we measure performance and who do we feel accountable towards. On the first one, I mean, I can tell you we are a 40 billion revenue listed corporation and we measure performance equally in financial terms, social terms, and environmental terms. 
That's how my compensation gets set up. That's how like we really report to the markets. And we do that because we believe that ultimately we equally answer to, of course, our employees, clients, and shareholders, but also to the environmental activists, to the communities we serve, to the social organizations, et cetera, et cetera. And I think that shift, it's not about, I mean, I don't want to discount it, but it's not about ESG reporting. It's really about thinking and understanding that any type of organization, public, private, if you want to be sustainable in the long run and live 100 plus you know, years life, then that's the world we live in. And that very narrow-minded focus of like we answer to shareholders, I mean, that's been there for 40 years. I mean, it's nothing in the world's history. So I think like that, sh that shift, uh, then, then you drive a very different impact, I think. Excellent. Thank you, Mike and Kareen. We're going to end with a, uh, a uh, oh, we've, we still have five minutes? OK, all right. Well, then we won't end right now. We'll end in five minutes. Um, I have a question. Actually, let's take one more from the audience, and I'll ask my question last here. Uh, Paul, if you can, yeah. By the way, while you're waiting to get her question, I agree with Howard that we shouldn't take the water from the Great Lakes and send it to the desert. I agree. Good. Or the Gulf of Mexico, which is what we're still doing right now. Thank you so much. Uh, great panel. I was hoping maybe you all could give your perspectives on how the water industry, wastewater industry, our natural systems, how by restoring you know, ephemeral uh, pools or the wastewater in our sewers, how it connects to the air and greenhouse gas emissions. Um, I'll start with that, um, being wetland centric is that because they're so biodiverse in terms of like the amount of plant biomass, so you have all these plants, trees, shrubs, grasses, forbs, um, I'm sure a colleague at the Planet Garden could speak more to this. Um, those are all doing the carbon sequestration, so taking the CO2 out of the land, putting it into the soils, um, purifying the air. And so wetlands, again, they are our lungs, they are our kidneys of the earth, and so they are, I think, one of our main solutions that we should be promoting and finding ways to innovate our thinking and incentivizing to do that restoration. Speaking of wetlands, um, I'd be remiss if I didn't say it here. Uh, the US Supreme Court, as many of you know, cut back the ability of the US EPA to regulate wetlands in the United States. Uh, somewhere between 60% of the wet, 50 to 60% of the wetlands that were protected under federal law no longer are, which means states need to step up. The Illinois legislature is considering the Illinois Wetlands Protection Act. Came close this legislative session. It's going to be up in the veto session. You want to do something about wetlands in Illinois, whether it's urban, central Illinois, southern Illinois, talk to your legislators, pass the Illinois Wetlands Protection Legislation. That's policy that will make a difference for Illinois, no matter where you are, for all the scientific reasons that you're discussing and for all the practical reasons that you were asking about and you're asking about before. This fall, we can make a difference. All right, any other? Let's try that again. Uh, yep, go ahead. Yeah, just, to, just to add to what was said, uh, directly, I mean, first, uh, the water energy nexus, because all of that treatment and all of this consumes energy, so decreasing that consumption, energy efficiency, but also energy production. I mentioned biogas. I mean, that's a direct replacement to extracting natural gas, so that's, you know, like in terms of emission, it is positive. Uh, but also biodiversity enhancement. We talk wetlands, which are... You know, like in a lot of places, like nature-based solutions in combination with grey infrastructure around wastewater, but also drinking water treatment can help lower by enhancing biodiversity. So the combination of all of that, uh, that kind of helps a net zero trajectory. All right, I want to end with a rapid fire question. We'll go down the line. So uh, the question is, what can I do? And I, by, I mean, People in the audience, what can I do um, to improve uh, the water 
uh, and the wellness uh, for our planet as it relates to water. Um, what's your one tip? Make it one statement. So let's, let's start uh, at the end with Melissa and we'll come this way. All right, I'm obliged, obliged to promote Shed Aquarium and come out with us for our action days to pick up trash, remove invasive species from wetlands, and also come kayak on the river to remove trash, do plantings, and enjoy our nature here. You heard me on wetlands protection legislation. Think about how you can use water more efficiently at home. Vote. <laughs> <laughs> totally vote. Uh, I would say that you don't, I mean, we absolutely do not need that. That's like a hundred times more expensive than tap water. So it's an equity issue. It's not safer. And if tap water isn't safe, then we vote, we advocate, and we push to get safe tap water. And uh, I think we have great tap water in America and in, in uh, Europe. But uh, if you want to make sure all the PFAS is out, all the lead is out, all the atrazine is out, filter your water at home for your family, your elderly parents and your little kids. Just some kind of point of use filtration is a great way to improve the health. I disagree with that. <laughs> I disagree with that. It's not equitable. <laughs> it's better to have big infrastructure for everybody. Uh, <laughs> when, when I ran Culligan, we were, that's what we were selling. Okay, so sounds like to be continued, at least with Mike and Corrine here. Um, let's give a round of applause for all of our panelists. What got me interested in food is uh, 12 years ago, uh, 2012, um, my uh, wife, who I, who I had re met at the time, she took me to a farmer's market for the first time, and um, I didn't expect much, but I was blown away by the flavors I experienced, and it was a rabbit hole that took me down the road of making all these films and in addition to the two that uh, Luke mentioned, I also have made a film about uh, seafood and the issues with, with that and I'm in the process of uh, churning out a fourth film about this topic and really the reason this topic is, has become so important to me is because I recognize that food and agriculture is one of the largest contributors to climate change. It's the number two contributor to climate change but if you actually in, include the numbers from transportation, it's actually the number one contributor to climate change. And here in the United States, half of our farmland, approximately 900 million acres of land, is, is half of our overall land, about 900 million acres of land, is used for agriculture. Among that, roughly about 70% of that is actually used to raise animals and to grow feed for animals. And the industrialization of animals and their meats is what brings our, our four panelists together today. They're all four involved in alternative proteins or solutions for how we can avoid meat being such a problem for the environment. If you don't know, uh, one-fifth of greenhouse gases is coming from ag animal agriculture across the world. So this is a huge problem. But um, our food and agriculture system doesn't have to be the problem. It could actually be the solution for how we mitigate climate change and how we create climate resilience. So with that, I'd love to bring a, our, uh, our four panelists up. Over here on this side, we have uh, Julia Stemberger from the Planting Hope Company. We have Thomas Jonas from Nature's Fine. And then uh, Mitch Harkenrider from Canopy Farm Management. And then Reginaldo Hoslet Maraquin from Tree Range Farms. So we have really two people here from the food product side, and then we have uh, two people representing the farm sites. So we'll cover quite a bit uh, in that. So um, let's start on this side, and we'll, and we'll go down the row and uh, tell the audience kind of what problem you saw within this whole system and how did you go about trying to solve it? Are you hot there? There we go. Technology. Well, we, we just talked about water, right? And, and you mentioned some of the statistics around uh, the, the, the impact of greenhouse gases. Water, about 75% of the water in the world 
is used for agriculture. Right? When you, if you fly to Chicago for the last hour of your fly, pretty much, unless you're flying over the lake, you're going to be flying over corn and soy. That's for animal feed. Right? About nine, over 90% of that is for animal feed. So the, the, the question at the heart of everything that we collectively do is how are we smart about using resources? Right? There is this tiny little planet that we're on. Uh, there's going to be 10 billion of us. Uh, there is climate change. We all know that. There is nothing new. But fundamentally, any technology angle that, and, and any technology progression is always about how do you get more with less. And it's not about doing less with less, by the way. I, I don't believe in that. It's how do we do more with less? How are we smart about using our resources? Now, smart when it comes to food and using resources better, I don't... I think just tilt towards your mouth tilt, like this. That's, that's then, the way to says, do it? Says the AV guy. Yeah. <laughs> okay. That's a secret. All right. Is that better? Yeah. There you go. There you go. Anyone not using their mic? All right. Um, so we're talking about efficiency. A cow, think about the cow. 90% of what you put in the front of the cow goes out in the back of the cow. So if you think about the cow, it's not a meat producing system, it's really a manure producing system that we put together. So we, we are scaling up in efficiencies. And, and for us at Nature's Fine, I'm, I'm the CEO and co-founder of Nature's Fine, it's all about bringing more efficiency. So we, we started from a research project for, funded by NASA on extreme forms of life. Uh, it was really about how should we look for life on the moon of Saturn. So we went to look in a very different place. We went to look in a very weird place, and that's the acidic volcanic springs of Yellowstone. And we discovered a bunch of microorganisms in there that had to be extraordinarily efficient because they live in a place where there is nothing. It's an acidic volcanic spring. If you fall in it, you'll be dead within a minute and a half. And they thrive in there. So there is really a lesson for us. And this is, this is how about you do more with less. Uh, so we develop a technology to cultivate them. It's a fermentation technology, and we currently do that here in Chicago at the corner of Pershing and Halstead by the, uh, by the White Sox Stadium. And we are able to do that in Chicago because we use 99% less water, 99% less land, and we emit 94% greenhouse, less greenhouse gas than a cow would. Uh, and we commercialize product using that protein, that, that protein that we get from this microbe, we currently are in about a thousand stores. We're at Whole Food, uh, and we have yogurt, we have a breakfast patty, and we have cream cheese. And we can do dairy as well as meat alternative. So how can we do dairy and meat alternative? How can we do dairy and meat? Well, what's the cow doing? If the cow is not doing dairy and milk. Once we have established this protein platform, there's a lot of things that we can do. And that kind of ties in, Julia, to a little bit about what you, what you do, because part of what you, you were looking to find was an alternative to, to the dairy industry, too, at some level. So why don't you ex talk about what the problem you saw and what you went, how you went about uh, solving it. Yeah, absolutely. So it, at the Planning Hope Company, which I founded about seven years ago, we decided that we were tired of seeing consumers look to adopt better-for-you solutions and ultimately getting things that really weren't better for their bodies or better for the planet. And frankly, a lot of the stuff that you'll find at Whole Foods or the rest, read the labels closely. It may not be what you think. And the plant-based milk category is one of those. Why is plant-based milk growing so quickly? Does anybody have any idea why it is skyrocketing by double-digit compound annual growth rate for the last 15 years? There's one, right, one answer. Go ahead. So that definitely contributes to people staying there and trying it. 75% of the planet is intolerant of dairy milk. They just feel like crap when they drink it. They don't die. They just don't have enough um, lactase in their system to be able to process the lactose in dairy. That's it. And yet you've got industries like coffee where people like cream in their coffee. People like milk in their coffee. You know, People use milk as an ingredient in all sorts of things because of the culinary value that it adds. But many of them just don't feel good when they eat it. So that's the reason plant-based milk is growing so quickly. Something that was a $7 billion industry in 2010 globally will be upwards of $100 billion by the end of the decade. 
And so when you take a look at, okay, this is a problem that we're solving, which is people wanting to have an alternative. There are alternatives out there, but what are they? Well, almond milk is flavored water. There's no nutritional value in almond milk, not a commercial almond milk. You couldn't, it'd be $20 a, a liter or gallon if you tried to put enough almonds in there. They just aren't. Um, oat milk is actually sugar water. Um, the enzymatic process used to create oat milk is the same one if you apply it to corn, you get high fructose corn syrup. Only the sugar in oat milk is much worse for you. It's maltose. It has a glycemic index of 105. A can of Coke has a glycemic index of 65. And if you look at things like soy milk, you know, they're highly nutritious, but there are a lot of problems with soy from GMOs to other things. So if we take the premise that, okay, number one, people need an alternative to dairy. Number two, the alternatives are not equivalent. Our premise was, can we develop a non-dairy milk that's as nutritious as dairy milk, because dairy milk, despite its challenges, is really good for you. It's got a lot of nutri nutrients, anything from protein to minerals in there. But can we do it in a way that's sustainable? And here's the other thing. As a planet, we have big, big, big problems that very few people are paying attention to. We all know about climate change, right? But how does that impact the food supply? Quinoa. Avocados, almonds, these are not crops that we can feed the world with. They are not scalable. We consider them part of a widely available healthy diet today. 50 years from now, they will be highly specialized if they're available at all. So how do we feed a planet that's going to be upwards of 10 billion people within 30 years? There are answers to it. And the answers include the kind of crops that we use. So while those crops aren't scalable, what are? Are crops like peas, beans, pulses, sesame. All of these crops actually are wonder crops. They're things that everybody knows and they're cultivated around the, the world and they're used in, in cooking very widely. But they're full of protein and they're full of fiber and they're great from a nutrition standpoint. And by the way, they grow extraordinarily efficiently with very little water, they don't require pollinators often, right? Big problem, almond farming in California kills off 30% of the commercial bees every year due to stress and pesticides. So no pollinators required, no pesticides required often, and they renew the soil, right? So these cover crops actually put nutrients and nitrogen back into the soil, so they're great. So what we ended up looking at is sesame a crop that we've farmed for over 4,000 years, but have never used nutritionally. It's often used as a cover crop. But if you take all the oil out of it, what you're left with is protein and minerals. So we developed our Hope and Sesame Sesame Milk, which is actually what we won the Chicago Innovation uh, Award for. It is nutritionally equivalent to dairy milk with eight grams of complete protein. It froth foams and steams, and it uses between 75 to 92% less water than any other plant or dairy milk on the planet. Very cool. So, so shifting now to the farm side, uh, you know, part of the overarching picture of, I, I think, what you can get from what these two have explained is that we have an industrialized system that inherently takes nature out of how we produce food. But it doesn't have to be that way. And that's why I'm so excited to have both you two here. So Mitch, why don't you first tell us about what, 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 what was the problem and what is the solution that you're all presenting? Well, the, the problem is that the climate has changed. The way that we grow food 40 years ago it shouldn't be the way that we grow food today. Um, farms are at risk from extreme weather. So the solution that we work on is reintegrating trees onto farmland. Um, on the surface, that sounds pretty simple. Um, it's a term today called agroforestry, um, but it's an ancient practice. Um, we do it a little bit differently in how we do it, adding in some technology, some modern bells and whistles related to GPS and the types of crops that we put in and how we analyze farms. But it's still putting trees on farms. And we, we do this in two flavors. I say there's two flavors of agroforestry. The first is conservation which is putting trees sort of on the edges of farms in order to protect the crops that are growing inside the farm from wind and other sort of environmental stresses. 
And the second one is lining waterways with shrubs or trees to prevent runoff from nutrients and soil, making sure that what we want on the farm stays on the farm and doesn't pollute further downstream. The second flavor is production. So if folks want to plant trees like nuts, berries, timber, something that they can harvest and make some money off of, we can integrate that in a couple different ways on farms. One of those is through alley cropping, which is an integration of different types of crops on the same farm. Um, you could also do orchard systems, kind of mixed orchard systems. And of course, silvopasture, which is the integration of trees and livestock on a farm. Integration of livestock on a farm. I think that's where, Rehi, that's where you come in. And uh, for, for those who don't, Rehi's actually a, a character in, in my latest film. And uh, I'm gonna, I wanna, uh, we're gonna bring up something here to show you, give you a, a visual of what it all looks like. But the, the general consensus has been that animal equal bad, right? Vegetable equal good. But when you look back at a lot of knowledge from the past is where we can really start to see where animal and plant are working together. So Rehi, tell us from your point of view and, and the solution you're presenting. Thanks, Hi, Matt, thanks for all the support. I don't know any of you in this room. Um, honestly, that was a really good thing because I don't know, maybe, maybe that uh, will be, um, I don't know, awkward for you to hear what I have to say. Or maybe it would be enlightening. If you think of synopsis, the one thing for sure is you will get new ones. Uh, and this is why uh, we have a problem that we caused in the name of food and feeding the world we have now effectively developed the technology and the ability to mass destruct, destroy the very ecology on which we depend to feed the world. That's why we screw up the climate. The climate is the result of how we have developed the capacity intellectually and technologically, mechanically and otherwise, to apply industrial scale ability to kill. That's the reality. None of the 84,000 plus chemicals in agriculture in the world today were developed to provide life. All of them to kill. That's the first thing of the problem. The second problem is that in the name of feeding the world too, we turn it into a colonizing, extractive, exploitative, we call it business, but it really is all those other things except good business. Because the cost of every, every gram of nutrition that you get today is exponentially larger than anything nature ever de delivered to us. The difference is we don't pay for it. We pass it on to future generations, to down the river, and now the cost of fixing climate, cleaning the water at the, the, you know, the Des Moines River down in Des Moines or the, in Toledo, all of that, you don't pay for that when you check out at the grocery store. Somebody else pays for it. The cost is astronomical. And so those are the problems we have. Now we can verifiably say that not only have we destroyed, we are, you know, agriculture is the, the, the second largest contributor to climate change, but also we are only measuring CO2. Did we account for the Gulf of Mexico's dead zone? Did we account for desertification that is now the result of that? The account, did we account for the hundreds of thousands of species that disappeared because of agriculture? In the name of growing, say, vegetables, for example, we have to destroy the whole ecology of a region so we can put one thing that we want. Yet, when we think about the solution, and this is where we came in this space, and we thought, you know, and I'm an agronomist, so I studied biophysics, chemistry, the loss of thermodynamics and all of that, and one day I asked my, one of my professors, um, don't you think that we are actually not in the business of producing anything? We have been fed that because we have been domesticated rather than educated into behaving and thinking in certain ways that are very linear and very good for the short-term extraction of natural capital, but not very good for our survival as a species. In fact, it's quite amazing that as rational species, we have done exactly the opposite. And so the professor says, I, I said to the professor, 
if you can't account for the mass of the tree on the basis of the soil that is around the roots, because it is so massively hundreds of times larger than the energy that it could have extracted out of the soil, doesn't it beg the question that we are actually involved not in the, in the business of producing things that we eat, but rather in the stewarding of energy processes by which the energy that has existed in the planet forever is transformed from non-edible forms into edible forms through the biophysics and the chemistry of the planet governed by the laws of thermodynamics that defines that energy cannot be created nor can it be destroyed, it can only be transformed. And on the basis of that scientific foundation, we came in and said, okay, where, where is the energy transforming then? Where is the magnificent design and what are the critical indicators of that energy a transformation capacity of the planet itself. You can't design a machine today that, can, that is larger than the planet itself, and yet we will deliver a magnificent energy transforming mechanism from which we can feed many times the world over. Just think of one fact, we, we throw away 40% of the food we already grow anyway. Just, just by that fact alone, you, you say, no, we, we can produce way more food than we need. So, what are the three places? Photosynthesis, animals, and the soil microbiota. That's where most of the well, land-based energy transformation infrastructure is centered on. And the design is so magnificent, but it depends on life and giving life, not taking it away. So we needed a strategy to enter the system. As an immigrant, I didn't have land. I also didn't speak the language, didn't understand the system, didn't understand a lot of things. But definitely I knew I didn't want to grow corn and soybeans or grow cattle in a building or any of those things. That's actually, I agree, it's a shedding machine. So, so we picked chickens, or chickens picked us, I guess. Because it's an easy entry. You can start small, but it is, in the livestock section of the three layers of energy transformation, that is where it happens at the fastest, largest scale on a planetary basis. You can take a, a, a hay bale, put it on a, on a pile, and it will take over a year to decompose it. You give it to a cow, and within 48 hours, you will poop it on the other side. And if cows are put into the landscape according to the biological process that actually balances out the energy flow, that cow is actually a magnificent energy transformation piece of natural design. It's the fact is that we use the cow to extract wealth, that's where the problem is. It's a human created problem, not a natural problem. And so the chicken for, gave us really the economic, social, and ecological strategy to get in because it uses, it's a jungle fowl, so it needs canopy, which means a lot of photosynthetic infrastructure. It's, it's very efficient at not processing nitrogen, which is critical because then we can bring the species that are actually in need of nitrogen, which they evolve hand to hand with each other, and now they balance each other out. That's what we did. We call it tree range for that reason, tree range chicken. You can actually eat it at Peterino's here in Chicago now. If you wanna go taste it tonight, just make an appointment because all of you will overload the place. Um, they are already overloaded. And I know you're going to stop me now, but... Well, I think this yeah. is a good point. If in the back, if you can bring up the video that I provide you with, because it's, it's hard to understand this. As someone who's tried to better my health and everything, I thought pasture-raised chicken was the way to go. But what you'll see here in this clip is footage that I had shot on Rahe's farm. And so, Rahe, explain to me what we're seeing here. Chickens in what we call a production unit, it's an engineering unit, one and a half acres. We put 1,500 chickens together. They go and range under the trees. There is forage in there that we plant intentionally, it's sprouted grain. The canopy is made of hazelnuts, which is hungry for nitrogen, which is exactly what the chicken needs. With formulas, we calculated how much they poop versus how much the hazelnut needs and balance it out so that there is no runoff or excess. And at the end of the day, we, we literally just tapped into the three layers to optimize the energy transformation space of any local ecology on the planet. We took this, tested it out in Mexico, in Guatemala, in uh, Canada, in Colombia, and now uh, we are centered on deploying this in the Midwest, in Minnesota, Iowa, and Wisconsin. And just to give you a number, just in case you think, okay, how do we feed the world? We did the numbers on this. The United States, we consume about 24 chickens per person. 
actually go eat your chickens with this system, you don't have to worry about it because it would actually take less than the total land in Iowa, Minnesota alone today to raise this way, raise all of the chickens we need to feed 10 billion people based on the agronomics and the math that we already worked out for you. So no need to feel guilty about eating the chickens. You don't have to eat meat. Sometimes I don't because you, you shouldn't eat too much of it anyway. But you can, and we can do it right, and the earth itself already gave us all the technology that we need. So just to be clear, what you're seeing, those, those are rows of hazelnuts and rows of elder, elderberry trees which absorb the nitrogen from the chickens. The chickens graze under, and it's all part of this energy transformation process. If you could switch to the photos now, the four photos, this is a hard concept to grasp, and even for me, it took me a long time to grasp the understanding of this. But so Mitch, so this is an example of, of what Mitch is working on with, um, with canopy farm management. And the idea is basically trees, which we heard from the very first panel, something we need more of, right? We need more trees. But half of the land in the United States is used for agriculture, which is taking trees out of commission. How can we incorporate those trees back into how we farm? So Mitch, tell us a little bit about this, and, um, and we can go to, there's three other photos here. This looks like it's possibly an alley cropping system where you have timber species grown and then maybe something that gets mowed down a hay and fed to livestock elsewhere. Can we switch to the next photo? Any chance it's possible to go to the next, the next photo back there? If not, that's a smallie. Sorry. <laughs> Sorry. Let's go to the next one. That's, All right. Yeah, that's that's the same farm as the small one. <laughs> this is Hudson Farm in Urbana, Illinois. Um, this is alley cropping with row crops. So there's a timber species. I believe it's black walnut. Um, that will mature in 50 years and then get a really nice price. It's a really high value timber crop. And then the alleys are leased to a local farmer to grow corn and soy on a rotation. And since we've planted the trees, uh, you know, laser lined, absolutely straight, according to GPS, the you know, big combines and machinery that modern agriculture uses can take the maps that we create about where the trees are, put it into their combines and systems, and there's not a big risk of mowing down half the trees or anything like that. So they work pretty synergistically. So what you're seeing here in the rows with the little white stakes, those are actually really young trees that have just been planted, correct? Yeah, those, yeah. those white things are and probably those five will foot be, tall tree tubes that protect the trees from those, any... Yeah. And they'll be significantly taller over time, right? Oh, yeah. Yes. <laughs> just want to make sure that's clear to everyone out yeah. here. This so, farm was planted maybe three years ago. <laughs> this photo was probably taken last year, so... Eventually, they'll be, you know, 60 foot tall trees. So, as um, getting back to getting back to this side of, of the table, um, so what systems like this produce is they produce nuts. They produce a lot of crops that we don't necessarily eat a ton of now. Correct me if I'm wrong. So the main um, crops for Rahe's system is hazelnuts, elderberries. Those are two crops we don't necessarily eat a ton of. What's the possibility of incorporate as, as we learn more about agricultural systems that can utilize certain crops that fit into more of an ecosystem-based solution better, what is, how, how can we get those foods, those, those crops into food production? Yeah, that, that's the easy part. And it, you're talking about great ingredients, right? And you're talking about two ingredients that are widely used in Europe in foodstuffs. You know, we don't use them actively much in North America because they're not farmed and they're not part of the culture um, in terms of the food as much. So, you know, that part is easy. Um, it's so. Let me tell you a little bit about what uh, Thomas and I have been up to this week. Um, I'm on the board of directors of the Plant-Based Food Association, and Thomas's company, Natured Find, is also part of that organization. Um, two days ago, we were together in D.C. on Capitol Hill, meeting with various senators and uh, the Agricultural Committee and representatives and their staffers, specifically about some of the larger change that needs to happen within the U.S. for us to be able to really scale an effective food system. 
And what's being talked about on this side of the table are all great ideas. And what we have created are all great ideas, and we have to be able to implement them. But there are problems with getting that done within North America, specifically within the US, as effectively as we would like. A lot of the ingredients that, for instance, we need to scale plant-based food are not ones that farmers are incented to grow in the US. Corn and soy are heavily subsidized because of animal agriculture. And the reason that they're grown is not for human nutrition, they're grown as feedstuffs. Well, it, try breaking that cycle. It's very hard because of the lobbying groups who are involved and because of the interests who are involved and it becomes extraordinarily political at the end of the day. I'll give you a small example. A part of the work at the PBFA is about policy and lobbying and working with the USDA and working with other groups to try to make plant-based foods more available. If you are a child going to a public school in the US, you're required to get dairy milk on your tray at school. Has to happen. If you don't want it, the only alternative is soy, and you have to have a doctor's note. And that's the only alternative that's available to be reimbursed federally. Well, 75% of the planet is intolerant of dairy milk, and it predominantly affects certain populations who genetically don't carry that lactase as much in their gut. Um, so Asian, African American, all of these populations are predominantly affected or more affected by this issue. And yet it is impossible to get that change to happen politically because anytime you say alternative, dairy and beef freak out. And they get very, very upset. And so what we have learned through our lobbying efforts is what we're trying to do is to take out restrictions because there are government programs available for developing things, but sometimes they're isolated and say this is only for meat, right? These funds are only for these specific things. So we're trying to level the playing field. That's one of the things we're up to. One of the other one is getting crop insurance for things like peas and beans. We have to get our peas from Canada. Why? Not because you can't farm them here, it's because farmers are better off farming corn or soy where they can get insurance and having the crop fail than they are farming some of the crops like we're talking about today, whether those be hazelnuts or elderberries or peas or beans or sesame or any of those because there isn't available crop insurance. So we're trying to get crop insurance authorized for these crops. But the, the linchpin of it all is that many of the crops that we're talking about are cover crops that would help to prepare the soil to be better even for animal farming. But yet there are all these barriers to break down that are very, very challenging. And so when you ask about this idea of what do you do with the hazelnuts and the elderberries, well, we brought another 20 companies with us, the PBFA, to this particular group. Usually it's about some of the board members, a couple of others. This was our first big fly-in. And what we were just comparing notes about right before this, about what we heard from the other member companies, is one of the biggest issues is processing technology and having processors available. So here's the other thing. You're growing a fresh crop. You have to be able to convert that into some sort of an end product efficiently, i.e. within a close range of where it's grown. Otherwise, economically, it doesn't make sense. And that processing technology is missing in the US. There are other countries that are investing in it, but we haven't made those investments as a company, as a country. So that's one of the biggest barriers is, you know, okay, you can grow the hazelnuts and you can turn them into food, but it's what happens in the middle. So we have a processing problem, and we also have a government problem. Thomas, you spent some time, well, you, you're from France, which has very different laws in terms of its food system and how it supports not just nutrition, but better growing. Tell me about the differences that you see from uh, overseas countries and how they manage their food systems versus the US. Well, it's certainly not perfect, right? But uh, if one of the things that it reflects, I think, in a lot of other um, countries, and in France, actually, in particular, is something that is very tied to what we just 
all of, all of us um, put forward, which is the recognition of two things. First of all, food is produced as living matter from an ecosystem. Right? And, and you heard how we have to build this ecosystem to get the best possible food because that's how you get this mix of rich nutrient. So there is a recognition of that. And the other thing, and again, I think it's a theme through, through what we, we're all saying here is biodiversity. We, on the planet, there are, we, don't, we actually don't even know, but there are millions and millions of species. Uh, less than 10 species represent about 70% of our calories. I mean, you need to, to think about it for, for a minute, right? That's why uh, these concentrations are just out of balance. So in, in places like France, but other countries in Europe, uh, but I think it's true in, in quite, quite a few places in the world, actually, there is maybe a little more of an effort to educate uh, children to eat a wider range of things, not just M&Ms. <laughs> a wider range of things, uh, and, and try um, and also educate palates early to accept this wider range of things. That's why in France, you, know, you have kids, you have actually chef that, you have programs where you have chef that go to um, early childhood school and have kids eat stinking cheese. But it develops a palate, develop an habit, and it develop um, the idea that what is a little foreign is actually interesting, and they're curious about, about that in food. So I think we, uh, we can definitely gain from that. I think it's, a, it's an interesting perspective. And, and by the way, it was a perspective here just as well. Chicago pizza, you know, the pizza, it's, I think the Italian would like to claim it back. It's, uh, you know, it's Italian. So there was, there was this idea initially uh, in, in American food there was much more variety, and that kind of has been um, a little bit uh, pressed down by, by big food because we scale up big things corn syrup, you know, all, all, all these great things that we're familiar with that are very efficient, very cheap, and, and can create nutritional imbalance, for sure. Yeah. I think this is a good time for questions. I'm sure there's a handful of questions out there. Ra raise them up nice and high if, any, if anyone has any, any, any thoughts. Okay, right here. Yes. Good afternoon. So my question is more of a, I mean, there are no like uh, medical doctors on stage, but I'm sure you guys are aware of how food is impacting health of women, reproductive systems and whatnot. If you can talk a little bit about that, because that's an area that's very interesting to me. And I do go to Whole Foods and I'm always reading labels and I'm always looking at websites to see what affects the endocrine system what affects you know, our uh, reproductive system, um, because food does make a difference. So all these pesticides and when we eat it and how it um, integrates into our ecosystem, because the body is very intuitive, right? It's, we don't even know all of the things that the body can do, but I'm pretty sure that there's gotta be, we need to start talking about like how food affects the health of human beings, right? Yeah, so. so that is a brilliant question, and I'm happy to take it, because what we're doing from a food system development has global repercussions. Here, here's what's happening. If you take Asia and Saudi Arabia, just, just two parts of the world to look at, one of the, and Latin and South America, actually, one of the number one health issues that's come up over the last 20 years is type 2 diabetes. Why is that? There are a number of factors. Number one, we haven't changed the cultural diet since we've changed how people work and live. So we went from primarily manual labor to desk labor. Different types of calories have different types of impacts, but yet if you take something like rice that is used widely in all of those countries, it has a very high glycemic index with it. So. The second piece of this is that you have um, the integration of some of the U.S. fast food concepts that have expanded overseas. And so people are now eating a different type of food and a different type of calorie. Fast food and other things are adding to this type 2 diabetes. Why is type 2 diabetes becoming the biggest health issue that we're seeing across these areas and why are people investing in it? 
It's because the type of calories that we're eating is shifted to things that aren't good for us. But yet, at the same time, there are plenty of other things that we could be eating that are predominant within those areas that are high in fiber and other things that could be helpful. So something like rice, for instance, seems very innocuous, but it's responsible for 10% of the global methane. And places like Indonesia who are concerned about food security, which the other thing that we saw globally does resonate when you're talking on the Hill is food security. Why can't we do it in the US? Countries like Indonesia are ripping out the peat bogs that we need for carbon sequestration that we can't replace to farm rice. More rice, more rice, more rice. Well, when you farm rice and you flood the fields, you create the environment for bacteria to thrive that creates the methane. So what we're doing is we're taking a food stuff that's no longer popular, right for the environment, the, the people who are eating it. We're investing more in it. We're ripping more out of the atmosphere and we're doing it out of a fear of not having enough food to feed the economy. So it's changing those base building blocks that is gonna impact global nutrition. And the, th and the thing about um, crops like rice is that rice was never white to begin with. It was, the original rice was, was red and original methods for um, pest control with rice actually involved ducks and other, um, and other species of birds. Um, the, 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 Rahi, are you familiar with this, the, the forms like this of natural pest control? Using? No, but her question was about what about the health of the person? And here's the thing, everything that we put out there comes around. So right now, if all of you took a urine sample and took, take it to the lab, you will show positive for glyphosate. Whether you ate organic, whether you even came in contact, it doesn't matter. So back to the question. Well, glyphosate uh, is the main ingredient in Roundup. Just Roundup, for, ready. Yeah. Crops all over. I mean, all those millions of acres we're talking about, most of them are actually being sprayed over by glyphosate to the point that now rural schools, for example, that are close to fields, corn and soybean fields, are actually, all the children are actually sick. I mean, how the heck do we just do that? And that, we are doing it, especially through women, because as women are breastfeeding their children and you know gestating them and all of that, they're just passing all of this, all of these diet-related diseases we're talking about, we're now passing them genetically. Glyphosate now, the active uh, ingredients, is now latched into our DNA, for example. There's you can't even detoxify anymore. Like this is the kind of problem we're trying to solve. So this is not something that we just go around and build another machine to fix it. It's, it's, it's la la land, if that's what we believe. We gotta fix the fundamental problems that we have here, and that is that we are producing the very poison that is making us sick, and the food is one way we get it. So let's we, change the food we do, eat. Do we have time to end on a positive note? 20 seconds from... <laughs> 20 seconds from each person saying what, what the audience can do. 20 seconds from each of what the audience can do to, better, to participate in a better food system. Support life, eat our chicken, and stop eating confinement chicken and cheap food. I would say stay educated and follow groups that track policy at the state and federal level. There's a great group called the Illinois Stewardship Alliance, and they have newsletters. If you're like me and you don't really track it exactly, they have letter campaigns that you can be a part of and submit your name to share with your representatives that you care about these issues. The reality is that in the US, people say they care about sustainability, but when they go to the grocery store and they make a choice, it's not part of their worldview. Make it part of your choices and how you make decisions. This is what Gen Z is doing. This is what Gen Alpha is learning to do. This is what's happening in Europe. But it's not what's happening in the US. Our data show that people say they care, but at the end of the day, they don't let sustainability drive their consumption decisions. So think about what you're eating, learn about how it impacts, and start making those choices. And that's what every single individual person can do to make a change. Learn. It's very easy to get, these things are complicated, right? I think it's pretty obvious, these things are complicated. We all feel that the nutritional guidelines are changing. We thought something was good, then it turns out it's bad. It's complicated, and, and again, we're talking about systems, and the, the, the iteration and the reverberation within the systems can be complicated. So s get informed, try to understand this thing the best you can. Be careful about simply sim too simple answers. If it's looked too simple, 
It probably is, right? And it, it, it's not easy, but it's, I think we all have to do that, and we'll all stay healthier if we get smart and informed. Uh, we talked about, we finished earlier the panel about, we, we, you know, go and vote. And if you want to vote well, be informed. And I think those things get together. And, and being smart is the, the first step to being uh, active. Okay, I, I know you're trying to shut this down, but there's one other but thing you're, you're that gonna, I think we need to say. And it's about the pressure. voting. Policy is being set right now that impacts your lives. And it's not always good policy. Glyphosate drove Prop 65 in California. It's a huge problem that was trying to attack the issue that you're referring to, but it ended up creating an opportunity for shitty lawyers to take money from companies who are trying to do good, and it confused the heck out of consumers. There is lots of bad policy that seems like it's heading in the right direction. The people who are writing the policy are the people that you don't know on the ballot. When the ballot's really long and you're like, okay, I know those three people, I'm voting for these, and then I'm just gonna check the rest of the boxes, that's where the policy comes from. Become educated on what those people are doing, because those are the people that are actually impacting your lives directly at the end of the day. I'm so excited to introduce my panelists here. I'm gonna first bring on stage Dr. Ralph. Muleisen from uh, Argonne National Lab. He is the chief scientist there that, and he leads research and development of technology, tools, analysis to improve sustainability and resilience of the built environment. Next, I'd like to bring up Ralph, Dr. Ralph. Thank you. Next, let's bring up um, Vic, Vic Grant. Vic is, uh, was former senior managing director and led sustainability services for Accenture, and he's gonna tell us about something new that he's doing now. He's advised companies for over 20 years on managing their organizations uh, more successfully through sustainability, digital transformation, and strategic partnerships. Okay, next up, we have Francis Wang. He is the CEO of a very successful startup here in Chicago called Nanograph. Under his leadership, Nanograph has raised $65 million in venture funding in 2023, one of the year's 10 largest battery VC rounds. And Francis has 25 years of experience in storage, clean energy innovation, commercialization, and manufacturing, and he is um, an Evergreen Climate Innovations portfolio company. Please welcome Francis Wang. So we're really lucky we have the research angle, the corporate angle, and then the startup angle. And I'm gonna start off uh, with our panelists. I'd love it if you all would give a little context to the audience about what kind of climate impact you all can have or your organizations can have as you scale up these solutions. And let's start off with uh, Ralph. All right, thank you, Amy. And I apologize for opening this bottle of water, but there wasn't glasses of other fresh water that were taken from the tap. And when you get a dry mouth, you have to do it this way. I could have brought my water bottle, you're absolutely right, but it's sitting in my office because I use it five times a day and go through about 100 ounces of water, but I didn't bring it with me. So I'm sorry, Emily. <laughs> you, if you're gonna call me out, you get your name called out too. Uh, so as Amy said, I'm the chief building scientist at Argonne, and there I lead a research group that works in building and industrial technologies as well as I, the interface to the Building Technology Research Office that's in Energy Efficiency and Renewable Energy for the Department of Energy. Um, and while I, we do a lot of work, and maybe we'll talk about some of the innovations a, a little bit later, much of the work that we do is development of tools and analysis that goes into decision makers' hands. Um, I don't do policy, I can't advocate policy. If you ask me what I should do for policy, I'm going to punt that question. I have to take off my Argonne shirt and put on my own personal shirt, and the lawyers have told me it's always difficult to separate the two. So, um, I can We analyze. don't want him undressing in front of everyone. <laughs> I, I, but what, what you can do is ask me questions about impact of technology and, and 
what, what, what might be good and bad in terms of some sort of numbers, and I can analyze the heck out of a scenario. So, so I guess I can say is, while I, you, you shouldn't ask me to lobby, you can ask your, uh, the lawmakers and the decision makers to give me lots of scenarios to analyze, and then I can let you all know what are the best outcomes that I can do. But one of the things that we look at um, within our group is trying to understand how we can help stop the world from melting. Uh, I, before I came to Argonne, I was a professor over at Illinois Tech. It was IIT when I was there. Lots of reasons for rebranding. But I, I was a professor there. And people ask, when you moved over to Argonne, how did things change? Do you, do you feel like you're still contributing the same way when you were a professor? and trying to educate the next generation. And I'm like, you know, I miss students. I really miss being able to teach and interact with the students. But at Argonne, every day when I go home, whether I was actually writing some code or doing some analysis or physically in the lab, or even if I'm just sitting here trying to deal with the visa issue of a postdoc who's trying to figure out how they're able to stay in the country, I know I help stop the world from melting a little bit. And that feels really good. Because we've got a big problem when we look here. We, we know global warming. You've heard all the, the, the talk that's been going on here all day about our problems with our land, problems with our air, problems with our water. And our built environment is just as big a contributor. When we look at the United States and the built environment and, and carbon emissions, Buildings account for over a third, about 35, 36%, depends upon which year. That's bigger than transportation, it's bigger than industry, it's bigger than agriculture. It's the biggest contributor to our global greenhouse gas emissions in our built environment. And we don't have to be building new buildings the same way we have, and our buildings, when we have to do changes, when pieces of equipment break, when windows need replacing, when I need to change my heating and ventilation system, we don't have to do it the same. When we look at that 35%, half of that greenhouse gas emission is from the electricity we use for running our computers, running our air conditioning, running our refrigerators, running our heating and cooling. We expect that there's going to be a big change in the grid. There's policy work going on. There's technologies that are working hard to clean up the grid. I actually have confidence it's going to happen. I don't know that it's going to happen by 2035, which is what what the, Illinois is targeting for, and much of the United States is targeting for that. But it is going to happen. It's going to clean up. Between renewables, between nuclear, between energy storage to help out all those renewables, we're going to get to a clean grid. Maybe not absolutely clean, but really clean. Which then means we've already cleaned up half of the energy in buildings. So now we have to think here, where else is that coming from? And the bulk of the rest of it is fossil fuels being burned for heating our buildings. There's a little bit for our gas stoves. And no, the government isn't coming to take your gas stoves. Um, most of the rest of that is for heating. And we have ways. We have technologies. We're working on technologies that even here in cold climates and in Minnesota where it's colder, in the UP where it's even colder, we can electrify our heating. And so we can then take away almost everything else. So the Department of Energy just released a blueprint for decarbonizing buildings that by 2050, a 90% reduction, if we look at the introduction of technologies and policies to both equitably and affordably bring this to market, we can be doing 90% reduction in our greenhouse gas emission in buildings by 2050. That's what I'm working on. That's what I'm helping to enable. Awesome. And we're going to hear more about Dr. Ralph's research uh, as we get further along in the panel. But now let's talk to Vic. Vic, give a little context to everyone about the work that you've done with corporations and what can corporations do at scale to really have a climate impact? Thank you, Amy. So uh, I'm going to start off right, uh, you know, Dr. Ralph, you said 33%. Uh, uh, the, the statistics I've used is 40% of the 
carbon is trapped in the built environment. So buildings are, we, as we call the built environment. Out of that, 70% is in the existing buildings and 30% is from the construction. So, you know, still very, um, you know, numbers that uh, when you look at that, you're like, okay, they, if that blueprint is successful, it'll make a big change. 90% is uh, definitely, definitely huge. So uh, until a couple of months ago, uh, I was uh, leading Accenture's uh, sustainability practice in North America, where I was serving uh, large corporate clients. And, uh, you know, my focus was uh, on a couple of uh, big vectors, one of which was energy transition. You know, 40, I led a billion dollar business there. 40% uh, of our business was in energy transition, helping clients which want to move to clean energy, uh, helping clients which want to move to uh, clean hydrogen, helping clients which want to look at uh, new avenues. Uh, so from anything to transition of energy, we were helping clients uh, build uh, EV manu battery manufacturing plants. So it was pretty wide, almost 40% of uh, that was coming from that, that type of uh, business. Then another 30% was coming in technology. So just some statistics for you. In 2007, Technology accounted for 1.5% of energy usage in the world. Today, it is uh, 4%. By 2040, it will be 14%. So at the rate technology is growing, how can we make the technology itself greener and cleaner to so make sure that uh, we don't end up in a situation where we have more demand than need? I grew up in India, and when I came to the US, Power cuts were never heard of. Where I grew up, we used to have power cuts every summer. So the electricity can be given to the farmers so they can run tube wells to irrigate the, the, the crops. And so, you know, we could be in that situation globally if we don't keep up with the supply and demand balance that we are, imbalance that we are creating. I'll tell you a couple of uh, cool projects that I've worked on. Uh, so one project was working with a large global bank which has raised uh, a couple of billion dollar fund to uh, electrify fleets. And uh, so we're working with them to bring clients to them who are looking for fleet transition. And Accenture as a transformation agent, we will help transform the fleet and the bank will fund and these clients will get the benefits of the transformation. So what do I really do? I used to call two things which I'm still continuing. I'm an evangelist. I evangelize sustainability based on the facts that it's real, climate change is real, I evangelize. I also say that I'm a Mythbuster. How many here have seen the show Mythbuster? Okay, quite a few. I bust the myth that sustainability is all about uh, tree hugging and it's all about uh, you know doing good. It's actually also about economic value creation. That is the aspect that I evangelize as well that Clean energy creates new jobs, jobs that weren't there before. So focusing on sustainability is creating economic value, and that is the aspect I always lead with, because when you talk about that, then suddenly you get the money, you get people who are excited about it, and you get everyone rallied around it because you aren't just going to do something that is just going to cause good. So what do I do now? Uh, I retired from Accenture a couple of months ago, and uh, I have started my own uh, company where I'm advising PE firms who are actually at the heart of uh, sustainability, who are um, either sh making a shift or investing in technologies that are going to uh, green the planet. Uh, I'm also uh, in talks to almost accept a board position with a company that is uh, in fleet electrification. Uh, but most importantly, I'm doing what my passion is, which is around sustainability. Terrific, and I think maybe we have a few companies that could use your help, uh, Vic. And I would completely echo the fact that um, my fund invests in uh, solutions that have climate benefits, and we do not think we have to sacrifice anything in financial returns to deliver that impact. So there is this myth and this idea that if it's good for the earth or if it is sustainable, it's somehow more expensive or not economically viable and I think you made a, a great point about that, is certainly the job creation. When you look at the energy uh, sources, uh, wind and solar and batteries are creating way more jobs than traditional fossil fuels. So, um, all right, Francis.
Please yes. give the audience a little context on the battery industry and what your company is doing and sure. what kind of climate impact it can have. Sure. So, oh, hello. Hopefully you can hear me. Um, so I lead a company called Nanograph. Um, we're local to the Chicago area. We actually have a plant uh, in Westtown. Um, we're a spin out of Northwestern University and there's been a bunch of, um, you know, uh, founders that have impacted Chicago over the years. Um, what we do, we make a product that, we have a technology that makes lithium ion batteries significantly last longer. So when we started the company back in 2012, the focus was on things like this. In 2012, the big problem was your iPhone didn't last long enough. Um, and so over time, we've been able to demonstrate our technology. We've had a close relationship with the military. We've actually been funded by the DOD. They've helped fund our two plants that we have in Westtown. We've created a product, and that product this year is getting to market, which is a huge milestone for any um, startup company, especially a battery company. Um, the focus these days and the hot thing over the last, call it seven to 10 years, has been electric vehicles, and now we're even talking about you know grid-scale balancing and things like that for batteries. Um, to throw out a few statistics, I mean, in terms of automotive, if you combine automotive and grid inefficiencies included in that heating, that's something like 45% of the CO2 emissions globally. So these are two big hitters. Um, batteries are a potential solution for both of these. EVs is the, the hot thing today. Um, I'm just curious in the audience if you could raise your hand. Do you have, how many people have an EV or a hybrid vehicle? That's pretty good. Um, I think the national average is something like eight or nine percent, which, you know, so you would expect more out of this audience than your average audience. Um, but I guess my point is we still have a long way to go, right? Um, the U.S. government, Biden administration, um, historic legislation with the IRA, the BIL, there's billions of dollars to try to get a U.S. battery supply chain off the ground. Nanograph's one of the companies that's trying to be part of that. I think we have a unique technology. We, um, you know, our pathway to market has been different than many um, startup companies, especially like your West, West Coast type companies. Um, we've been successful and it's step by step to get the product out to market. Um, the energy storage space moves slow and that's the problem. Things change happen slowly. Ralph was just talking about the grid and you know it's always been um, an interest of mine to see that happen. The technology is there to do it and I think energy storage is getting to the a cost point where it actually is feasible. Um, so I really truly believe over the next decade, you're gonna see, let's call it by 2035, more than 50% in the United States, more than 50% of the cars on the road will be electric. Hopefully we'll begin to see some um, renewables and you know balancing of the grid through energy storage out there. These are all things that can make an impact on the environment. And, Automotive and power generation, these are, these are two big hitters. Let's stay with uh, Francis for you for a second. Will you talk a little bit about uh, Nanograph's founding story? You're not the original CEO, and, um, but you're, we're really glad that you, we were able to attract you to the company because of all your experience. And maybe mention a little bit, like why is Chicago a good place for a company like Nanograph to grow? Yeah, so truth be told, I am not a founder. I think a lot of people think I am. The, the fact of it is, is I've been at the company longer than anyone there, so I don't know if that gives me some sort of status, but um, a, a quick story about Nanograph. It's kind of a neat one. Um, so it's really a bunch of, there were, there were three Northwestern students, um, one MBA in Kellogg, and two material science students. They got together, took a class, Part of the class was to write a business plan, and they went out, created a business plan about a lithium-ion battery material. They did a pitch, the Rice Business Plan Competition, which is like the largest business plan competition out there, and they won, 
they actually got a um, million dollars to start this company. Um, Samir Mayakar, um, my predecessor, uh, went on about five years ago uh, to become deputy mayor of Chicago, and then I jumped in, took over as CEO. Um, we had different views on where the company could go, but I mean, I think we've worked together over the years to, to make it a success and grow it to what it is today. To, to answer your question about Chicago, um, I'm not from Chicago, I'm actually from the East Coast, but Chicago's become my home. I've been here almost a decade now. We'll forgive you. Thank you. Um, and I think there's kind of two things that have been, that make it a great place to start up a startup company. Um, it's really the people and culture. So on the people side of it, you know, we, we've got a great talent pool. It's incredible universities. We have a national lab nearby. That's all been great in terms of bringing in the very best talent. Um, the other part of the people equation is the, you know, ecosystem we have here. I've had, um, we've had great investors. For example, Evergreen, uh, Amy was in the early days. Thank you, Paul. I don't know if Michelle's still here. But Evergreen, uh, other funds like Energy Foundry have all been instrumental in us, you know, becoming what we were. They're always a phone call away. And as everybody knows, or anyone knows that started a company, um, it's difficult. There are terrible moments, um, you know, shit hits the fan. And it's been the people in this ecosystem and that have been there for us, so thank you guys. Um, the other part of our success I would call um, culture, um, Midwest sensibilities, if you will. I think, um, you know, most of the people that make up our company for, our company are from the Midwest. Um, I think far often you see a hubris on the West Coast. Apologies for those on the, from the West Coast, but especially about clean tech, right, and batteries. Um, there's an approach there. Um, I mean, there's, there's been so many categories, whether things on the West Coast, AI, lately. They've done amazing, but batteries is slow. There really aren't disruptions, at least in the history of batteries, very few. Things happen slowly. Um, and I think it's been that, you know, day after day, hard work, making progress one inch at a time, you know, what I call very Midwest sensibilities has been a big part of our success. So it's been the people and the culture. That's awesome. We're really proud of all the progress you guys have made and excited about what's to come. Vic, let's go back to you. A lot of these companies have made these net zero pledges. So the, the, the promise to reduce their carbon emissions by a certain date. And I think they're getting pressure from their shareholders, their employees, their customers. Is it, are they very serious about this? Uh, and if so, like, what have you done or what can they do to actually meet those goals? Yeah, I think, uh, so, so first of all, uh, to answer the question directly, so they are very serious about it. Uh, I had an opportunity to uh, be at the UN last year on a panel. And uh, again, I was representing corporate, and we had legislatures on the uh, on the panel, and then we had uh, you know various uh, you know organizations and various uh, countries, their representatives. The long and short is that uh, there is a little bit of a this going on. Corporations are saying that the legislatures need to put more teeth into the legislation, so uh, we are held to a higher standard. And uh, SEC tried something. Uh, it's not perfect, but it's a step in the right direction recently. Uh, so companies are definitely going to respond by making sure that uh, they are doing something. Now, it's not that these corporations were not doing anything before this legislation was there. The corporations had already set their goals, and they were moving towards that. Uh, where we have been playing is uh, a various, a few different spaces. Uh, first and foremost, if you are held accountable, you need to monitor because you cannot if you cannot measure, you cannot track, you cannot hit the targets. So we were helping them with uh, pulling data from the system and making sure that you have a very robust system to report, track and report and make sure you are compliant. Then there was like, uh, you know, a lot of the companies are in a growth mode. So what worked yesterday is not going to work tomorrow. So how can you get ahead of that? Even us as an Accenture, in the last four years, uh, our headcount has grown 2x. Uh, almost to 720,000 employees. 
So how do you keep up with that growth? And how do you manage your stakeholders? Because when you're in a growth mode, one of your big stakeholders is your employees. And every time I go and have a conversation like this, uh, people come up and say, my employees are coming and putting more pressure than the stakeholders or the shareholders or the legislators and saying, what are you doing to get better? So that's where I've been playing and helping uh, these companies on see what is around the horizon so you can manage those stakeholders really well. And I would say the third thing is uh, we do a survey uh, across these uh, more than like 1,000 companies. Pretty much every C CEO said that I want to be ahead and I want to actually not just get to 2025, I want to do it sooner than if possible. So yes, they are serious, but there's still a little bit of, uh, okay, let's all go together because without that ecosystem being there, we cannot accomplish the goals because it's a very daunting task. Great, great. I'm glad to hear they're serious and I, the SEC rules, would you just tell the audience what these SEC rules were that just came out, they were, they were sort of clarified a few months ago and I'll let you talk, to, talk about what they are. Basically, uh, everyone has to uh, make sure that not only you report uh, scope one and scope two emissions, but also scope three emissions, uh, which is really big. Uh, if you look at a, a company like a Microsoft, uh, you know, 95% of their emissions are uh, scope three emissions, which is all their suppliers and their supply chain. Uh, only 5% is there. So unless that type of legislation is there, you don't have incentive because you can easily punt and say, well, I'm controlling what I can, but it's them who are not doing it. So making sure that the whole supply chain is accountable, it's a big thing. Great. Great. Let's hear about some mad science going on at Argonne National Lab. So one of the cool things is I get to go into the lab and, and talk to people who are way smarter than me and, and are playing in all kinds of cool technologies. Um, one of the first ones I'd like to talk about actually gets back to, the, we've been talking about energy storage and batteries. So this isn't within my group, but I've been following the technology as we go along. And it's a new use of artificial intelligence that's being used to optimize the charge and discharge of batteries. Um, so I don't know that they have a name for it. Well, actually, there is a name. I can't actually remember what it is because it was so nondescript and bad that they need to come up with a better name. Um, the inventions have been filed, and I'm sure that they're going to be looking for licensing real soon <laughs> on, on this new te technology. But the idea is First, as you're developing new cells or you have batteries that have come off the assembly line, the, the, the standard ways of testing to look at how long the battery is going to last and how, how the reliability is going to change takes, had, using standard procedures, takes years. And they worked developing AI-assisted um, measurement to move that to months and then moving it to weeks. So what not, used to take two weeks when you would have a battery and you could not do more than a few handfuls and you could not do cycles of new variations of your batteries because of the amount of time it took to do that testing can now be done in a matter of weeks and they're hoping to get it down to days or hours. Once we have that worked out, taking that basically those AI models and using them in inverse is gonna tell you exactly the best way to charge and discharge. And the idea here isn't just for new batteries, but when a battery has reached its end of life in a vehicle and you're now going to reuse it, how is it that you can best charge and reuse this as a second use battery? So instead of having a five years to eight years in a car and then you have another five, maybe you can get another 10 years, maybe you can get 15 years for this useful life in its second use. There's even talk of possibly being able to use to reverse some of the degradation that goes on in the batteries if we can figure this out in terms of charge and discharge. So I think that's an amazing technology that's going to be looking for someone to come work with Argon and take it away. Let's talk later, Rob. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, one of the other technologies that I think has a day-to-day -day effect on everybody here has, is some of the advanced modeling capabilities that Argonne's been doing with respect to transportation modeling. Argonne is developer of a model called Polaris. 
which is an agent-based model. So you model individual vehicles and the individual people that are driving, and we have a model of every vehicle and person who's out on the road and walking and driving in the whole Chicago land area. Well, we don't have your data. It's the statistical model. <laughs> so, so don't worry, there's not a lot of PII there. But the idea of here of being able to look and optimize um, a system, the entire transportation system, with new technologies coming in line, electric vehicles and how they may be used in charge and how they get used differently, the idea of making changes to public transport, the idea of understanding that as we rebuilt the, the Eisenhower and we're going to take the third worst road in America and make it five times worse, what are, what's going to happen to transportation? It's, it's, it's one of the things, it's a wonderful tool that I would like to see more use of. Um, the last one is actually what I'm working with from something called Chain Reaction Innovations. This is an Argonne spin-in. Entrepreneurs come and apply and get funding from Department of Energy to work with the lab to overcome significant technological problems. And I'm working with a startup called Kazadi Enterprises that is developing a, an actual chemical-based engine, calls it Entrochemical Methods, to be able to move heat, distill water, and recharge um, uh, different types of, of systems purely without electricity, just using the, the chemical basis of salt. Love it. And these are examples of digital solutions. So uh, the idea that how software, I mean, you're talking about these elaborate models. This is, this is software, and they're running on very high-powered computers that Argonne has to do this modeling. And that's honestly a really significant breakthrough in the last few years, um, that we have this power in the software itself to kind of show us a, a vision of the future and really analyze some of these molecules and otherwise physical products. I'm gonna to come to the audience for questions in just a second, but before that, let's do a rapid fire down the line, short answer. What is one world-changing energy innovation that you all hope to see in your lifetimes? Uh, fusion, actually, really fusion. I, I want to see fusion. I want to see small modular fusion reactors. Love it. Love it. Excellent. Vic. Energy becomes so cheap that it's free. Wow. That's a big idea. That's a big idea. Francis. Uh, solid state batteries. Um, I think they're not there today, but I, I do think in my lifetime we'll see that. That'll be game changing. Excellent. Let's go to the audience. We have time for a couple of questions. Who's got a question for our esteemed? Oh. Right here in front, sir. So um, if you had to look at energy storage, uh, specifically batteries and maybe lithium, lithium ion batteries, um, the two big concerns that you hear right now is, you know, A, the environmental impacts of mining the rares, and then two, the, the quasi-monopoly that a single country has over their production and, and battery, battery production, right? So given what, where we are right now, like, how do you see the trajectory evolving? Like, if you have to read the tea leaves, right, within the next 10, 20 years, like, are we going to see new kinds of battery tech emerge that are going to overcome some of these issues? Like, from both from a technology and a market perspective, where are we headed towards, in your opinion? I will. I will take one part of this and and not answer the second part of the question. Or what I'm going to start out with is. We need to be thinking about batteries in two ways. Mobile technologies, which are still going to be lithium ion and sodium ion variations, but then storage, stationary storage where the physical size is not as big a barrier and a complete shift away from lithium and sodium and uh, well, other critical materials to flow batteries, to redox batteries where we're going to have less of a problem. Those are they're out in demonstration. There's more work being done in the lab. I see that's a big space where you're looking for large amounts of, of, of storage, um, we call it stationary storage, and that's a different place. And that's going to help because we don't need to be using those same materials that we need to have for vehicles. Yeah, I'll add to that a little bit. Um, it, I, I think you're going to see more distributed energy storage as opposed to centralized, right? So centrals out there, these are you know big pump hydro facilities. But I think 
Tesla's headed down the right track. I, think, I don't know if you've seen that power wall that they have. I think you're going to see more distributed energy source, small pockets of it that when you aggregate the good that they do in balancing the grid out there, um, you know, I, I think you're just going to see a lot more of that, especially as the cost of storage comes down, right, to where we get to like $50 per kilowatt hour. I think these types of things make sense. But I think what what Elon is doing with the power wall, it hasn't caught on yet, but I think it's in the right direction for sure. You'll see more of that. Let's have one more question. Let's see. I took one over here already. How about, I saw him first, right back there. Yeah, our question is for Vic. Uh, when you're working with these corporations to transition the energy they're using, I'm sure for a lot of them who have net zero goals, it's a lot harder, especially if they're manufacturing something that can't necessarily be using electricity or other stuff. To get actually to net zero, what do those conversations look like if the transition capabilities aren't there? What are these companies supposed to be doing to at least like neutralize their carbon footprint? Yeah, uh, every now and then we did run into a challenge like that. And, uh, you know, uh, first of all, uh, if I understood your question right, uh, you're saying that if there are companies who are manufacturing and they cannot buy clean energy, is that what you're asking, right? So I think the, there was also uh, talks about actually buying energy credits short term while thinking of how do you pivot to a cleaner uh, energy, uh, especially in the process industry, uh, the use of hydrogen is actually a big uh, change. Uh, it's, it's going to be a step change uh, that is going to enable a lot of these process industries to actually use clean energy. energy. But the short-term solution that companies are looking for is just uh, buying the, the credits to make sure that they are at least compliant. OK, so I'm super proud of you. And I thank you for the innovative work that you're doing because we definitely have to change course and direction. And I have a couple of concerns. One concern is about, you know, the visibility of the unsustainable and kind of inhumane harvesting of some of the minerals that have been happen that's been happening in different African countries. And given that the one of the recent court rulings you know, um, they ruled that American companies don't have to be regulated because they are not the owners of the inhumane companies. I'm, I was wondering what adjustments can be made to make things a bit more humane, given those constraints. And then secondly, with the EMFs that all the different electrical machines radiate or emit, you know, um, is it a big priority? Is that something that's being prioritized by the big tech companies to study the long-term exposure and the possible health implications that those may have on people as we charge forward in this very important work? I can start with the fifth part. Uh, so one of my uh, colleagues worked uh, a lot with mining companies uh, and uh, resources companies. And I think there is enough pressure from the shareholders and stakeholders to uh, employ and deploy practices which are ethical uh, and that are going to make sure that uh, there is longevity of mining versus, okay, let's take everything out right now and uh, hurt the, the earth. So if I understood your uh, question correctly, I think there is a big movement towards that. Uh, whether it's in the local uh, country regulation or not, that I'm not very familiar with. But I am familiar with that uh, most of the corporations, whether they are based in the UK or US uh, or Australia, they are actually bound to the shareholders and stakeholders to uh, have ethical mining practices in place. So I think that pressure needs to continue because that pressure will then make sure that at the local level, they are also getting those practices uh, deployed. Uh, as far as your question about EMF, I have never heard of any credible research that says EMF from normal electrical radiation has any effect. I'd be much more worried about your 5G, 6G, 7G, 8G cell phone. Uh, 
have one last rapid fire question for our panelists. What is one thing that people in this audience can do to have the greatest climate impact in their life? What is one thing they can do or change in their life that can have the greatest climate impact? I'm not going to answer that. I'm going to ask a climate impact. And it's learn how to use your programmable thermostat. Don't let this be the flashing VCR of the 21st and a half century. Go home and in the summer turn it up and in the winter turn it down and put on proper layers or take them off as needed so you don't have to waste heating and cooling when you don't need to. I will say remember the acronym ART, A for adapt, uh, continue to adapt, R for replenish, uh, continue to replenish the nature uh, that gives us, and tease to transform. Transform your daily habits so you can become more efficient. Uh, my answer there is sustainable transportation. So when you can, take public transportation if you're downtown. Um, there's divvy bikes all over the city, which I think is nice. Get on a bike, go to work, it's good for you, right? And maybe at the very least, walk to work. Might take a little bit more time. You might have to wake up earlier, but those are all, you know, movements in the right direction. Those are all excellent. And I will just tie us back to the last panel. And I know one thing that everyone can do is just eat less meat. That's one way you can have a positive climate impact. Everyone, please join me in thanking our panelists for this. And thank you, Amy.